ladies and gentlemen. The hearing of the Committee on Women, Children, Family Relations, and Gender Equality uh, on Senate Resolution Number 446 is now called to order. Noon pong mga nakaraang buwan, nakilala ko si Rhea, isang kasambahay na nagka-COVID matapos mahawa sa employer na namatay. Siya daw ay pinag-alaga sa matandang employer habang nag-quarantine na hiwalay ang pamilyang pinagsisilbihan at di na siya makatanggi dahil ayaw niyang mawala ng trabaho. Nung nag-positive siya, dinala siya sa isang public quarantine facility, ngunit pagkatapos niya gumaling, ay di na siya pinabalik ng asawa ng kanyang employer sa bahay nila. Nung di siya makahanap ng matutuluyang bagong employer, nag-ipon siya ng pera pabalik sa probinsya. Pagbalik naman doon, ay pinagbubugbog siya ng asawa niya dahil di daw niya napagtagumpayan, manatili sa Manila para magtrabaho. Nakairaya na yata ang lahat ng tema na ating tatalakayin ngayon hinggil sa gender dimensions of COVID. Gender-based violence, health mobility and public safety, at economic exclusion. Pero sa totoo lang, bagamat kalunos-lunos ang kwento ni Rhea, hindi ito masyado magkalayo sa kwento ng napakarami pa nating mga kababaihan. Wala pa man ang COVID, pasan-pasan na natin ang maramihan at magkakatiyak na pasanin o multiple and intersectional burdens. Lalo pang pinalala nitong pandemyang pinagdadaanan nating lahat. Our hearing will flow this way, um, dear friends. As earlier mentioned, we are tackling three major themes. And for each theme, we will hear a report situationer by an organization that has conducted a study specific to this theme. The first is gender-based violence, and the report will be presented by Plan International. The second is health, mobility, and public safety. And that report will be presented by the United Nations Population Fund or UNFPA. And the third is economic exclusion presented by Centro Women. Centro represents around 80,000 workers in the private, public, and informal sectors. We request our dear presenters to keep to 15 minutes for each of their presentations. After that round of presentations, other civil society organizations may wish to provide additional inputs to the presentations for uh, around five minutes each. My fellow senators and I may also ask clarificatory questions. In the second hour, we will ask our government agencies to comment on the presentations, focusing on the following questions, among others. What policies are currently in place to address the specific needs of women and children under a pandemic? What policies should be in place, especially policies that need legislative fiat, to address the needs of women and children under a pandemic? These issues of women and children girl children especially, have largely remained invisible during the pandemic. It's time to put women and children front and center. May I ask uh, Comsec Gigi to please identify uh, the resource persons present. Good morning, everyone. We would like to acknowledge the presence of our resource persons. From the Department of Foreign Affairs, we have Exec Executive Director Maria Lourdes Salcedo, Human Resources and Management Office. We also have Director Sheila Mari Andales, God Secretariat. Attorney Susan Phoebe Sabado, Principal Assistant Office of the Undersecretary for Administration. And Ms. Joarlene Spiritu, Legislative Liaison Specialist. From the Department of Health, we have Dr. Cheryl Garcia Gavino, Division Chief. Women and Men's Health Development Division, Disease Prevention and Control Bureau, Ms. Jessilyn Artuyo, Health Program Officer 2 and God Secretariat, and Ms. Riva Gutierrez, Liaison Officer. From the Philippine Statistics Authority, we have Ms. Anna Jean Pascasio. From the Philippine Commission on Women, 
we have Deputy Executive Director Christine Balmes. From the Philippine Overseas Employment Administration, we have Attorney Geraldine Mendez, Office of the Deputy Administrator, Licensing and Adjudication. From the Overseas Workers' Welfare Administration, we have Director Jocelyn Hapal. From our civil society organizations, from Plan International, we have Ms. Alexandra Jean Pura, Country Program Manager for Gender and Inclusion, with Ms. Pauline de Guzman, Ms. Mona Mariano, Ms. Camille Madis. From Oxfam, Philippines, we have Attorney Patricia Miranda, Policy Advocacy Manager. From UN Women Philippines, we have Ms. Cherise Hordan. From the United Nations Population Fund, we have Ms. Amy Santos, Gender, Gender-Based Violence National Program Officer. From the Coalition Against Traffic Trafficking in Women, we have Executive Director Ms. Jean Enriquez. From the Philippine Legislators Committee on Population and Development Foundation Incorporated, we have Ms. Nenita Dalde, Advocacy and Partnerships Manager. From Lagablav Advocacy Network, we have the Secretary General, Attorney Claire De Leon. From UNICEF Philippines, we have uh, Mr. Paul Del Rosario, Gender Focal Person. From CARE, we have Ms. Cara Medina, uh, together with Ms. Mary Joy Gonzalez, Project Manager for Resilience and Innovations, Learning Hub, and pa Partners for Resilience. And Ms. Raya Dukusin. From... United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees, we have Ms. Ariel Ann Gonzalez. Uh, from the Commission on Filipinos Overseas, we have Ms. Janet Ramos, Supervising Immigrant uh, Services Officer, and Mr. Michael Apatad, Senior Immigrant uh, Services Officer. Uh, for, that's all for now, Madam Chair. Marami salamat, Comsec Gigi. All right, so let's begin now with the situational reports on the ground. Uh, I'd like to call uh, to present that on gender-based violence, uh, the presentation by Plan International. Uh, who will it be to, to present? Will it be you, Ms. Pauline, or another of the resource persons from Plan? Senator Lisa, it's Jean. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you. So, uh, Ms. Jing Pura, please, the floor is yours. About 15 minutes, if you please could. Salamat po. Uh, salamat kay Joanna for helping to operate the slides. Can you all hear me? Yes, we can, Jing. Okay, salamat. Uh, Senator, um, ang share ko ay... Mula sa dalawang research na ginawa ng mga kasama din dito sa hearing na ito at uh, dalawang research po ito na ishare ko ng sandali lamang at kasama po namin sa design team ang mga nandito din sa hearing, ang UN Women, UNFPE, Oxfam, UNHCR, CARE at UNICEF. So uh, magandang araw po, Honorable Senators, Members and Staff of the Senate Committee on Women, Children, Family Relations, and Gender Equality. Thank you for the invitation to speak before you to share the findings and recommendations from two research we conducted from April to May. One focused on gender and inclusion issues entitled Silayan, Voices from the Pandemic's Hidden Crisis, a Gender and Inclusion Assessment of COVID-19 Impact. The other one focused on voices, perceptions, and insights of girls and young women aged 13 to 24 entitled Through Her Lens, a survey on the impact of COVID-19 on Filipino girls and young women. The Gender and Inclusion Assessment was a collaborative effort of 27 agencies, humanitarian NGOs, women's rights organizations, UN agencies, and supported by the Commission on Human Rights and the BARM, Ministry of Social Services and Development. The assessment had 951 respondents from Metro Manila cities, rural poor communities in Samar and Bicol, and in the IDP camps in Batangas and Barm. Through her lens report is based on analysis of 1,203 complete and valid responses to the survey on COVID-19 impact on girls and young women from Luzon, Visayas, and Mindanao. 
Plan International Philippines is humbled and privileged to speak on behalf of these organizations and the more than 2,000 research participants. We came across many stories that help give shape and life to the disembodied numbers that we see. I will first share the key findings and recommendations from the Gender Inclusion Assessment, followed by key findings and recommendations from the Girls and Young Women Survey. So we came together to conduct the assessment because we shared the vision of Bayanihan Heal as One Act. From what we found out, the safety net to catch the most vulnerable groups of women and girls has huge gaps through which many are systematically falling through. We know that better data leads to better decisions, and indeed, there has been a clamor for reliable data that can shape and inform the interventions to this pandemic and track progress and effectiveness. Through the through Silayan, we aim to amplify the experiences of vulnerable groups. So we, during the interviews, we met a homeless woman with disability from NCR. We met a young mother from Samar. And we met an IDP woman, a senior citizen from Barm. So these are the key findings. Uh, gender bias and gender inequality manifest in women's increased care work and increased responsibilities in community engagement and volunteering. Community-based health workers on the front line, more than two-thirds of whom are women, are under-resourced, underpaid, and are disproportionately responsible for COVID-19 infection, prevention, and control in their communities. The BHWs think it is their duty to serve, serve their communities, and for some it is a way to be close to the LGU, to access resources, even though the small stipend they receive is ironically what disqualifies them from food relief and the SAP. They expressed how much they bear the brunt of people's frustration and fear and how they're stigmatized as possible carriers of the disease. Restrictions on mobility have undermined women's economic status and increased their reliance on men for transportation and mobility. As entrepreneurial women migrate to online platforms for their livelihood, Many others face barriers, including lack of internet access and hardware technology. On social protection, as women and their families experience job and income loss, they rely heavily on public financial assistance. And though majority report receiving ayuda, more than 40 to 60 percent say it is not enough to fill their family's daily need, especially among indigenous people seniors, and interna internally displaced people, or IDPs. Quite a number report that they did not receive the SAP because they are not recognized as constituents of the LGU, because they do not have a physical house or permanent address, or they are not registered voters in the area, or they are not a member of the housing association, or they are young mothers who are assumed to be under the care of their father. We have begun to call them the hidden households. We know thousands of OFWs were stranded at the airports and returning migrant workers shared that they are automatically considered ineligible for AYUDA without consideration of their actual income or savings by the time they are sent back to the country. Wars, where before they are seen as modern heroes, they, now they are seen as COVID-19 disease carriers. For a number of women respondents, there are negative coping mechanisms such as pressure to engage in prostitution, begging or mendicancy, and suicidal ideation. Yet many women also persevere through what we call pagdidilhensya or resourceful problem solving. Some entrepreneurial women respondents talked about online sell selling and finding new markets to trade in or using their relational skills to get help and relief from others not ashamed to borrow money. Uh, in terms of access to basic services, specifically on WASH, VAUC, and SRHR, along with the economic loss, respondents report significant disruption in their access to basic services that they need during the pandemic. One of the most challenging disruption being access to water, sanitation, and hygiene facilities. 
lack of access to water increased anxiety among respondents with a barrage of messages that say hand washing is the most effective way to be COVID free. A specific concern for women and LGBTQ respondents is access to SRHR or sexual and reproductive health and rights services. The pregnant women among the respondents worried about their access to prenatal services and medical treatment for their babies. Two out of five women respondents say they have limited access to contraceptives. It is well documented that crisis escalate incidents of gender-based violence and this pandemic is no different. Interviewers heard stories of increasing tensions in households because of the economic insecurity. Women locked down with their abusers in unsafe homes and know that abusers are exploiting and manipulating quarantine measures to enforce their abuse. For example, taking away their cell phones, which has been a lifeline during the lockdown, or refusing, refusing to drive them to work and making them lose their job. As gender-based violence survivors are locked in, so are GBV service providers who are now unable to respond to cases in person. And not just the service providers. Traditional case reporters of gender-based violence are actually teachers because of their daily interaction with many children and parents. But as schools have closed down, they are no longer able to report cases of gender-based violence to authorities. Reports from our DSWD contacts indicate that most of their programmatic budgets have been reallocated towards another round of SAP distribution, leaving minimal budget to operate GBV services or shelters as more are needed. Thus, the dramatic decrease in reported cases since the lockdown. Uh, this is a fig these are data from 23 women and child protection units nationwide. From nearly 1,000 reports in January 2020 to 108 reports in April 2020. It's quite a dramatic drop in reports. Uh, in terms of access to information, in a pandemic, access to correct and up-to-date information is life-saving. It is important to all affected people to help them make sense of the situation and reduce their risks. The migration towards online platforms will leave some communities farther behind without additional and affirmative support, resources, capacity building. The elderly, internally displaced, and indigenous respondents reported having the most limited access to the internet and mobile signal. In terms of participation and leadership, we saw that LGU leadership matters very much. There were many stories of effective and responsive governance where food relief and sub distribution were fair, efficient, and frequent. And there were just as many stories of indifferent governance where the approach was more punitive and about instilling fear. The research revealed that local, municipal, and provincial governments obtained high levels of trust from constituents. Respondents report a willingness to cooperate and discipline themselves to comply with quarantine measures despite the hardship. So hindi pala po sila pasaway. The stories from women respondents were very attentive to the consequences and impacts of this pandemic, seeing both the positive in terms of increased individual and family discipline, improved family relationships, and even stronger faith, but as well as the negative impacts including increased surveillance and militarization. The women respondents had a front row seat to what was happening among families and communities, and yet few women actually sit in decision-making tables. A recurring theme in the interviews is the lack of significant representation of women in the IATF where critical decisions are being made. Why is it important to have women in leadership and decision-making roles? Because their experiences can make them more cognizant of experiences of girls and women. Our experience shows that they are particularly hard hit in health emergencies. Even before the pandemic, girls already face double discrimination simply because they are young and female. These are the recommendations from Silayan. The research revealed that the impact of interventions to prevent and control COVID-19 transmission were not balanced. We found out who felt the most negative impacts. These are those most at risk with little or no resources to cope with the lockdown. The, the first recommendation is about rendering hidden households, families, and individuals visible to have better monitoring of who are being missed out and who are being excluded. 
we need to harness the vibrant local NGOs, CSOs, faith-based networks that have access to the heart to reach households and individuals. And indeed, they were the ones who actually helped us reach out to this uh, vulnerable uh, constituents. There is also concern about the target numbers for social protection. The government targeted 18 million, but this is based on 2015 poverty data. Current poverty level is almost 22%, and this translates to 24 million poor needing assistance. This is a difference of 6 million. 18 to 24 million affected. This has huge implications for how social protection can be made more responsive. The crucial role of LGUs, the role of technology to help manage big data, and targeting who needs to receive aid the most. We need to develop targeted risk communication in precise, culturally resonant messages using low-tech modalities that integrate COVID-19 infection prevention and control with risk factors such as gender-based violence, mental health, and the social stigma brought about by being COVID positive. Internet connectivity through information technology infrastructure could be much more improved for access to education, for access to life-saving information during this pandemic, and as lifeline to protection services, especially GBV hotlines. The local governments are at the forefront of risk reduction and management. Continue, therefore, to enhance local BRRM capacity, the understanding of the interplay of hazards, risks, exposure, and vulnerabilities is still very uneven. Real experiences of multiple hazards and pre-existing vulnerabilities should help to ground local development planning with meaningful participation from citizens, especially those traditionally marginalized. And these are girls, young women, and women with intersecting vulnerabilities. The pandemic and the response to this surface the weakest points of our social, social and economic systems. Basic services that women depend on for daily survival and well-being tested by the pandemic are wash facilities, gender-based violence services, SRHR services, and mass transportation. Worth noting are stories on women's leadership. Diverse women find similarly diverse ways not just to cope, but to thrive. BHWs, mostly women, considered it their moral obligation to support COVID-19 response despite risks to personal safety. It is worth exploring what difference or impact women's leadership can make in a situation as fluid, evolving, and uncertain as this pandemic. The sense of voluntarism is strong across most respondents. People are willing to end the pandemic, and they do so in ways that they deem possible. Young persons and the elderly elect to stay home, as they feel it is how they are most helpful, while others support in relief distribution, express intent to report suspected VAUSI cases, or generally cooperate with government-mandated security protocols as they wish to protect their loved ones or help their communities. And where government's response fails, civil society and ordinary citizens endeavor to do what they can to bridge the gap. This bayanihan is amplified in the time of COVID-19. The second research, uh, through her lens, a survey on the impact of COVID-19 on Filipino girls and young women is a was also a collaborative effort of more than 30 agencies and institutions that include the Philippine Commission Women, uh, GAD offices of several government agencies and institutions, Women and Child Protection Desks of PNP, universities, schools, women's rights organizations, youth organizations, the Girl Scouts of the Philippines, and child rights-focused NGOs. Using an online survey, over 25,000 girls and young women provided information on their perception of the effects of COVID-19 on their environment, health, education, and economic opportunities. We processed uh, about 1,200 responses uh, from the pool of responses for analysis. So these are the key findings. Girls and young women reported more cases of gender-based violence online. Fake news, aggressive trolls, cyberbullying, and offensive exchanges online are among the examples mentioned in the survey. There is increased supports from girls on incidences of sexual harassment, circulation of lewd and indecent photos and videos, and online sexual exploitation. There is lack of awareness on where and how to report cases. Girls who reported cases of violence either online or offline are not aware of what happened 
to these cases, they also said that most people in authority did not respond to the reports. COVID-19 has not only worsened gender-based violence experienced by girls and young women, it also amplified gender inequalities at home, resulting in unequal division of labor, undervalued care and domestic work, missed classes, and limited economic opportunities for girls and young women. In the survey, girls and young women reported their inability to study and work at home because they have to take care of their younger siblings or do house chores. This responsibility, which is often delegated to female household members, places a burden on girls who are studying and young women who retain their work during the crisis. Some girls shared that they ventured into online tutoring jobs and online selling, but found it difficult to juggle this with household chores. The abrupt shift to online learning caused many students to miss their online classes, exams, and submissions due to factors such as limited access to the internet and technology, distractions at home, and the mental and emotional adjustments to community lockdown regulations. They also felt the economic effects of the disruption and closure of markets and businesses. The breadwinners and their families lost their source of income and became reliant on relief and financial assistance from the government and NGOs. Meanwhile, respondents working at the time of the survey also shared that getting infected while working worries them a lot. Still, they choose to ignore this worry so they can continue earning to support their families and for some, their own education. Girls and young women are concerned about their mental health as they remain locked down in their homes. Boredom, anxiety, depression, fear, and failure to be productive are among the indicators that their mental and emotional health are suffering. They also worry about their parents not having work, the lack of money to buy basic necessities, not receiving government aid, and the violence observed and experienced offline and online, the inability to go outside and shifting of classes online. All these threaten their emotional and mental well-being. Citing SAP as example, many girls said that the distribution of financial assistance is unfair as many deserving families and individuals were not able to receive assistance. They observed tendency of government officials to favor their own family members, and they also cited corruption, incidences of corruption. Some families are receiving weekly relief from their LGUs, while others never received any. Another key finding of this study is the gap in social protection and relief assistance for girls and young women. Majority of girls said that while their families are receiving relief assistance, the assistance excludes their needs, such as hygiene kits, uh, the essentials such as sanitary pads. Information on how to access sexual and reproductive health services is also lacking, so pregnant teenagers and young mothers are struggling during the lockdown. Access to health and financial insurance for young women, both in the informal and formal economy, was already a challenge prior to the pandemic and continue to be a challenge during this time. Overall, from both the gender and inclusion assessment and the survey amongst girls and young women and from our experience in working with them, girls and young women are particularly hard hit in health emergencies. COVID-19 heightens the threats to their education, health, safety, and economic empowerment. They face greater responsibility to do household chores and care for family members. Many might never return to school because of domestic tasks and the shift towards income generation. Their health and lives are at greater risk because of reduced access to sexual, reproductive, maternal, and child health services. We also know that quarantine measures increase tensions at home, economic and emotional stress of families, and the limited access to protection services put them at greater risk of exploitation and abuse. They are also more likely to take on high-risk work due to loss of jobs and source of income. We also know from health crises in other parts of the world that these factors, along with child, early, and forced marriage, all contribute to the rise in teenage pregnancy rates and the number of maternal and child deaths. We heard from the Population Commission in the recent Senate budget hearings about the dismal statistics on teenage pregnancy where 40 to 50 girls aged 10 to 14 give birth every week. This survey, this survey demonstrates that when girls and young women are given the platform and opportunities, they are capable of helping and improving response efforts during a disaster. 
The quality of insights and suggestions gathered from the respondents also shows that girls and young women are critical observers in their community. They are considerate of the suffering, not just of their fellow girls, but also of the people around them. Girls and young women could be agents in building cooperation, solidarity, and unity in their communities. And these are their recommendations. No? They said that provide information about gender-based violence and online violence and access to safe reporting grievance and justice mechanisms for the victims. Also, provide access to contraceptives and hygiene kits, including sanitary pads and other sexual and reproductive health services. Provide mental and emotional support through psychosocial and wellness programs. Ensure access to quality education by improving internet connection and signals in the localities and rural areas and exploring other means of distance learning. Provide assistance and guidance for parents and guardians to support girls and young women who are studying from home. And in information dissemination and awareness drives, please include guidance on where to access hygiene and sexual and reproductive health items and services, how to protect themselves from harassment and violence, and where to access psychosocial support services during the pandemic. They also mentioned allocation and prioritization of funding for the specific needs of girls and young women, provide access to a safe platform where girls and young women can report, speak up, volunteer, and contribute to decisions and solutions during emergencies, such as during this pandemic. The survey findings should make us adults recognize that girls and young women have important things to say. They should be treated as citizens of our society. We must listen, communicate, and bring them into the conversation, involve them in planning and decision-making processes, knowing what they need, understanding how they are affected, and recognizing how they can contribute are important first steps in ensuring that girls and young women are protected and safe during disasters. We call on the government to put girls at the heart of COVID-19 recovery and response. Only by prioritizing their protection and needs can we ensure a safer Philippines. To conclude, we'd like to invite you to read the full reports. Uh, Silayan and through her lens, to have a fuller picture of how COVID-19 has impacted our diverse constituencies, especially those with vulnerabilities, but also to see how they are manifesting cooperation, desire to end this pandemic, their capacity to survive, and how they can be supported more effectively given the resources at our disposal. Thank you once again for this opportunity. Thank you very oh, much you also, Jing. Yes, maraming salamat, uh, Jing, at sa Plan International for that very comprehensive uh, and truly intersectional report. Actually, dual reports, no? both from Silayan uh, and uh, from... Uh, uh, through her lens. Yes, and also from through her lens. Um, also giving new names to perhaps old phenomena, but that have been exacerbated under the pandemic conditions. Tinutukoy kung saan yung uh, traditional strengths of women and girls, which ironically have been uh, exacerbated also as vulnerabilities under the pandemic conditions. Pero tinuturo din sa atin, gaya ng tinukoy ng mga rekomendasyon ng Silayan at saka Through Her Lens, where uh, these strengths may be mobilized through greater support, uh, including in terms of providing information, access, um, and guidelines. Interesante talaga yung mga bagong pangalan in a way for pre-existing phenomena like hidden households and therefore identifying these hidden households as in fact locuses of mobilizing uh, women and girls. At saka yung sinabi nyo rin na di po pala sila pasaway. No? So understanding a new um, what women and girls can actually bring to the table even in terms of um, pandemic response. Uh, we'll return to those various recommendations uh, after we look at the two other uh, situational reports on the ground and the inputs uh, from the other CSOs and of course our government uh, agencies aided also by the clarificatory questions of uh, Senators Aimi and Nancy and others who are here already. Yes, Senator Aimi, you'd like to raise a point? Yes. No, I just uh, wanted to... Um 
I just wanted to uh, manifest support for uh, those uh, NGOs that are here and uh, the other advocates for a uh, special consideration for the multinational, multidimensional impact of COVID upon women. And certainly in terms of health, 70% of our health workers and frontliners are female. Um, the uh, default family caregiver is obviously the mom, whether for the aged or for the children. Uh, socially, the burden of the lockdowns, the feeding of the family, the duties to care and educate the children always fall upon the mom. Economically, our MSMEs are also uh, female-led. Also, uh, the OFWs, to a great extent, the disposable uh, OFWs are the female domestic uh, workers. And in terms of domestic violence, despite the uh, protests of the police and the Barangay Capitanes, I am certain that Bausi has been violated repeatedly in the lockdown, simply not reported or uh, recorded in the blotters. Online porn has blown up, whether for adults or for children. And politically, may I just say that I believe if there were more activist women on the IATF, its most egregious uh, instructions would have been avoided, such as um, insisting we're all pasaway when in fact no hand washing facilities were provided, insisting na hindi sumusunod ang Pilipino samantalang hindi naman binubuksan ang mga kalsada yung ating mga stadium, kung saan dun sana maglalaro, maglalaba, magluluto ng uh, may kaunting physical distancing, hindi man lang naisip. Uh, most egregious, for example, uh, inuna pa yung mga barrier at yung mga barrier sa pag-angkas. Hindi yata sila nag-aangkas sa asawa nila. Kaya ta, kung babae yun, hindi mangyayari yun. Kasi ridiculo talaga yung uh, lalagyan ng barrier sa mag-asawa nga nag-aangkas sa motorsiklo. Um, if only there were war women in the IATF. And I don't know what the other senators um, would recommend, Senator Risa, our chair, and Senator Nancy. But I really think there needs to be a special women's uh, COVID desk. I don't know how we will do this, but we certainly need to uh, address these concerns. If the informal household-based care infrastructure falls apart, that is, women quit on uh, households and so on, or are so... Uh, um, are so uh, disadvantaged that they can no longer function, I think our COVID response would uh, be even more mediocre than it already is. Manifestation lang yon, and uh, uh, perhaps we can brainstorm on the steps that need to be taken going forward. Maraming salamat. Salamat din, Sen Aimee. We can also return to that recommendation uh, later, colleagues of a uh, women COVID desk. So moving forward now, uh, let's hear the situation report on the ground on health, mobility, also just mentioned by Sen Aimee, health, mobility, and public safety. Uh, ito naman po from uh, Amy Santos for UNFPA. Amy, you have the floor. Salamat, Senator. Magandang umaga po to our Honorable Senators, the members and staff of the Senate Committee on Women, Children, Family Relations, and Gender Equality. Um, I've been asked to speak on the gendered impacts of the pandemic, and we are grateful to Senator Risa Ontiveros for this invitation, and I'm very honored to speak here on behalf of the United Nations Population Fund. Um, the UNFPA is a strong partner of the Philippine government and united in achieving the three transformative goals that are to reaching sustainable development by 2030. We are the UN agency committed to achieving three zeros. Zero unmet need for family planning, zero maternal deaths, and zero violence and harmful practices against women and girls. Uh, maraming salamat kay Joanna who's helping me staff my slides. If I could go now to slide four. In this inquiry, UNFPA would like to provide testimony based on two studies that UNFPA initiated, the gender inclusion assessment that Ms. Pura has already explained quite in depth, and a mathematical modeling study that we commissioned the UP Population Institute to do. 
Now, first, the gender and inclusion assessment study really tried to understand more qualitatively and clearly how women and men in marginalized communities are experiencing the pandemic differently, what their needs are, what the barriers, the challenges, what the coping strategies and capacities that they're experiencing because of their described gender roles and the societal imbalance of power between women and girls, um, women and boys. And the second, the UPPI study, we try to project and calculate how the pandemic may affect the status and well-being of women and girls with regards to issues of health um, and safety. Now, although this is a global pandemic, we know that the Philippines approached it in a very specific manner, as um, Senator Aimee has already alluded to. We had the closure of mass transit. We had the assignment of a quarantine pass that allowed you to travel outside to secure food for med or medicine. There were security checkpoints along the perimeters of cities and provinces, an 8 p.m. curfew, and there were arrests if you violated any of these measures. And even as these restrictions were imposed on all Filipinos, qualitative and quantitative evidence show that they affected women and men differently. And even among women, different groups of vulnerable women suffered the worst consequences of these measures. Next slide. The restrictions on mobility in particular were designed to slow down no, and prevent the infection of COVID-19. Yet the unintended consequences of these restrictions may have helped reinforce gender discrimination and inequity, particularly in municipalities where community leaders default to gender stereotypes. So, for example, a number of respondents of our gender and inclusion assessment reported that when quarantine passes were exclusively put in the male husband's name because they're head of households, it disproportionately curtailed women's movements, making them dependent on their husbands for food, basic goods, or medicines. And at the same time, another set of respondents reported that the quarantine passes in their municipalities were exclusively named after the women because they were seen as the lone homemaker or the natural caregiver in the family. And here, the women respondents feel the extraordinary weight of care work because man's transit was closed down and they were heavily dependent on that. So in both these reports, the women respondents expressed either being immobilized or carrying the disproportionate burden of their family's welfare. And this is only one example. So when quarantine measures do not take into consideration the context and the circumstances of diverse families, of women and men who need to determine for themselves what they need and how to share the workload, they unintentionally narrow families' choices and may inadvertently cause harm by imposing a one-size-fits-all when not all people or all families are the same. Households do not have the same number of members. They do not have the same degree of health, capacities, or assets. So in this instance, making the decision for people and their families without consideration of their individual context or needs, they default to gender stereotypes, and we reinforce gender inequity and widen the gender gap. Next slide, please. And when we examined this further, we saw that across 11 categories of vulnerable people, people with disabilities were particularly vulnerable. No? The additional stress and depression that overwhelming care work brought with them. A significant number of respondents who were women with disabilities reported more stress and depression than women without disabilities. And at the same time, we saw a very pronounced difference between men with disabilities compared to men without disabilities. And here we see bias actually harming the men. Although we can only speculate no, why there is such a significant difference between men with disabilities and men without disabilities, we think that it's reasonable to suspect that men do not expect to do unpaid care work. And when they're forced by circumstances to do housework, men with disabilities suffer more mental health issues as internalized limited competencies are heightened. These are probably some of the more difficult and painful interviews that we did in the GIA. There were stories of suicidal ideation, no? of actually reaching the end of their rope. The Filipinos' very much famous, very lauded resilience beginning to fray. And we know from the National Center for Mental Health that calls to the hotline have doubled 
for the same period as last year. But we need more data on the potential gendered nature of these calls because this can help sharpen our response and our resources. Next slide, please. Now, in a health crisis, especially in a global pandemic of this scale, access to basic health services is crucial. Among vulnerable populations, you will see that red line. That represents the average baseline of respondents who say that they have continued access to health services. So slightly above that average, we see women, 4P recipients, and rural respondents more likely to report that they have continued access to health services. This might be an indication of how existing protections are holding traction and extending significant health benefits to those groups. However, farther below the average are several marginalized communities who report experiencing a disruption in their access to health services, which we know are vital in a global pandemic. We hear men, LGBT, urban poor, internally displaced people, and indigenous people respondents, we're saying that they suffer a significant disruption in health services. And this differential access of respondents in vulnerable communities mean we are leaving different groups of people behind systematically more than others. Next slide, please. Now, a specific health concern that targets women and LGBT respondents in our study specifically indicated access to sexual reproductive health and rights services. Next slide, please. And they have cause to worry. The results of the UPPI estimation model show that the reduction of services because of the disruption in mobility and transportation due to the induced um, community quarantine measures will lead to a 26% increase in maternal deaths. There will be 60 additional maternal deaths for every month of the community quarantine. An estimated 666 additional deaths if such measures were to continue until the end of the year. Next slide, please. The same study also showed that there's a substantial increase in the number of unintended pregnancies, 41.5%. And the number of women with unmet need for family planning, 67% among women of reproductive age. If the community quarantine will continue until the end of the year, the family planning service reduction is estimated to result in an additional 751,000 unintended births and more than 2 million women with unmet need for family planning. This also demonstrates an increase in the percentage of unintended pregnancies for adolescents at 22% and at 32%. These numbers are an ep epidemic in and of itself. Next slide, please. And if we put this into perspective, this translates into a reduction in the number of Filipinos using modern contraceptives under quarantine conditions. What was already a low baseline rate, one of the lowest in the ASEAN region, has become even lower. Next slide, please. And we also heard from women respondents who were concerned about their access to contraceptives, prenatal services, and medical treatment for their babies, with two out of five women saying they had limited access to contraceptives. And LGBT respondents similarly expressed a concern regarding their limited access to contraceptive commodities and HIV AIDS services. One out of two LGBT respondents expressed that concern. Next slide, please. And as Ms. Pura has already mentioned, young people will bear the worst brunt of this shortage in supplies and services. 18,000 more teenagers may get pregnant because of quarantine-induced service reduction. Next slide, please. And Ms. Pura talked at length about GBV during the quarantine. I'd just like to add a few more slides to show just to show how dire the situation is. We already have uh, multiple media reports of escalating incidents of intimate partner violence, of the growing numbers of child marriages as families cannot afford to feed their families and their daughters, and the alarming increase in the exposure to online sexual exploitation and abuse, as well as the unconscionable demands for sex for passage through security checkpoints. Next slide, please. But in the UEPPI projections, we can see that the COVID-19-induced community quarantine 
will lead to an additional 144,000 um, currently married women aged 15 to 49 experiencing physical or sexual violence by their intimate partners in this year alone. The study has already shown that a total of 733 um, currently married women are estimated to experience physical violence by their partners and 308,000 um, currently married women estimated to experience sexual violence by their husband or partners. And so we know that this is an epidemic within an epidemic. Next slide, please. And despite the higher incidence, we also saw in our study that the people most likely to be affected by intimate partner violence, the women respondents, reported that they're less likely to report GBV to the police. And among women, it's internally displaced women who are less likely to disclose and seek help from mandated duty bearers. Next slide, please. And so what are humanitarian groups doing in response? An inventory of gendered impacts must also be able to see the emergence of the interventions, the projects, and the programming that is rising to address the material problems and felt issues of constituencies that we work with. In the gender and GBV sector, organizations and agencies are ensuring that we have alternative reporting and monitoring portals. If people cannot go in person to the Barangay Vausi desk, they are now looking for remote modalities to do that. And then we're also ensuring that GBV services along the referral pathway are working, um, are not uh, being disrupted or discontinued. And so helping capacitate new municipal social workers and hospital-based women children protection units. Next slide, please. At the minimum, we need to ensure that essential sexual reproductive health rights services continue and that the service delivery system is adapting to the quarantine conditions and providing workarounds because people are still having sex, women are still having babies, pregnant women are still in danger of dying during childbirth. The UNFP has been working with women child protection units in lo relocating themselves outside the emergency room um, areas of hospitals because women are afraid to go near them in for fear of infection. And so we need to rehabilitate, we need to refurbish, we need to redesign in some of the ways we're providing these services. Slide, next slide, please. In response to the increased rates of GBV, we have comprehensive responses from groups who have established alternative reporting portals so that you can bypass the dysfunctional hotlines and the VAUSI desks, including um, a voice-activated mobile app that will actually allow GBV survivors to text their preferred GBV service provider when she needs help and to GPS the nearby shelter um, or WCPU so that they can go to the nearest um, agency. Um, and the Philippine Mental Health Association is providing free telecounseling services and we're seeing youth groups who are innovating solutions to the issue of online sexual exploitation and abuse. Next slide, please. And we're seeing in particular that cash-based solutions that very successful gendered interventions in addressing urgent health protection and work needs of women and girls who are almost always invisible no? and almost always left out of the big programs that are being done by their local governments. And so here we see that they're very tailored to their individual needs and capacities. Conditional and unconditional cash grants can provide both flexibility and incentive to specific needs that are otherwise ignored or deprioritized. Next slide, please. So in summary, what we're hearing from the field as well is that um, throughout this pandemic, we need to do five things. We need to, one, make sure that prevention efforts and services to respond to violence against women as well as sexual reproductive health needs are integrated uh, deeply into COVID-19 response plans. They need to be um, mandated and required. We need to, secondly, maintain um, a, a minimum standard of health uh, services for life-saving services and information that women and girls rely on. Three, we need to emphasize that women and girls who are already finding themselves in humanitarian and fragile contexts and are experiencing compounding crises are particularly given emphasis and support. 
For what we measure matters. What we count is what we see. So we need to prioritize the collection of accurate and complete age and sex disaggregated data in communities that we know are particularly marginalized and vulnerable. And we need to hold ourselves accountable to that data. And fifth, we need to connect the women and girls who in this pandemic are particularly socially isolated from one another. So we need to connect them digitally or through offline modalities that gives them continuous information about conditions on the ground, information about services that they can access, and how else to provide um, resources to them. So women and girls are experiencing this pandemic in different ways. We need to pay attention to these differences. They are less mobile, they're less free to move to address their needs, they're less safer, they're at higher risk for GBV, and they're at greater risk of becoming unintendedly pregnant or dying in childbirth. If we do not get essential sexual reproductive health rights and GBV services operational and accessible, we fail to serve vulnerable women and girls who are experiencing multiple pandemics right now. And there's never before um, a humanitarian crisis that has visited the whole of the Philippines. So understandably, an archipelago of diverse regional contexts will see div different outcomes and impacts. And yet, our overarching observation is that not one region will be spared by the reduction in health and protection services. And if we do not address them right now, the injuries and the invisible wounds that are felt by vulnerable women and girls will be there for years to come. We are extremely grateful for this invaluable opportunity to provide testimony um, in support of vulnerable women and girls. So thank you very much, Senator Lisa Ontiveros and all the senators on the committee. Thank you very much also, Amy, no? at saka sa UNFPA. I think what we're seeing here, beginning with the first report, moving into the second one, and then moving into our third one, ay pakumplika ng pakumplika yung nakikita nating fabric. We're trying to pull the strands apart to see more clearly the important um, details, uh, the epidemic within the epidemic, or actually epidemics within the epidemic na sinabi ni Amy, uh, multiple pandemics so that also moving forward lalo na dun sa scenarios na pinresent niya that if the quarantine or quarantines continue as they are till the end of the year such and such are the dire scenarios and therefore what um, interventions can and should we actually put in place especially if mahabi natin yung iba't ibang strands na ito into more effective and enabling empowering uh, response mechanisms uh, and systems uh, with high participation and leadership uh, by women and girls. So now um, we will move into our third uh, on the ground uh, situation or uh, report. Um, after which, no, I will ask um, Comsec Gigi na uh, ipakilala lang, i acknowledge yung ating mga bagong arrivals dito sa ating hearing. But for now, let's have the third uh, report on economic exclusion mula sa Centro Women. And for Centro Women, we will be hearing from Nice Coronacion and Mary Jane Labongray. So Nice at Mary Jane, you have the floor. Thank you, Ms. Chair. Maraming salamat, Senator Risa, at magandang uh, araw po sa mga kasama. No? Yung unang bahagi po ng aming uh, ibabahagi sa mga kasama ay yung, yung datos po na nilabas ng, uh, labor for, ng ating Labor for Survey noong July 2020 para po makita natin ano ba yung uh, figure ng mga uh, kababaihan uh, sa kabuang uh, usapin ng, ng paggawa. No? So, ayan po, uh, maraming salamat po kay Ms. Joanna sa pag-share po ng aming pong presentation. So, makikita po natin uh, sa ating presentation na uh, yung ating pong labor force as of July 2020 ay uh, 45,877,000. Uh, Thousand. At dyan sa labor force na yan, pag sinabi pong labor force, no, kasama po yung bilang ng employed and unemployed no, mula edad 15 years old uh, pataas. At ang kababaihan po sa 45 million na uh, labor force ay uh, nasa 17 uh, million uh, compare sa mga kalalakihan na 28 uh, million. Samantalang ang employed o yung sinasabing may trabaho, hindi pa po sinasabi dito anong klase ng uh, trabaho sila involved. Maaaring pong yung na-interview dito ay dalawang araw nagkaroon sila ng trabaho during the conduct of interview. Nalagay sila na 
na may trabaho. Pero syempre po sa amin po sa Centro Women, sa Centro at sa nagkaisa Labor Coalition, malinaw po sa amin na ang demand namin ay uh, regular na, na trabaho. So dito po sa employed uh, statistics, hindi pa po yan kinaklasify uh, dito. Ang employed po ay uh, 41 uh, million, samantalang ang mga kababaihan dyan ay 16 million at ang mga kalalakihan ay 25 uh, million. Ang underemployed naman, ibig sabihin, meron ng trabaho pero hindi sapat ang kinikita na ngailangan na maghanap ng trabaho. Ang underemployed ay uh, 4,799,000 para sa mga kalalakihan at 2,339 naman para sa mga kababaihan. Napakalaki pong uh, jump niyan uh, from the April 2020 uh, labor force survey. Kasi dun sa labor force uh, survey uh, natin nung 2020, uh, uh, nung April 2020 ay 2,026,000. So after uh, three months, no, nadagdaga na agad yan ng uh, 300 uh, thousand na sobrang nagdodoble kayod at uh, effort dahil nawalan po ng uh, kabuhayan. At makikita din natin sa mga ibang tala ng labor force survey na tumaas ng 14.7% ang mga manggagawa na nagtrabaho less than 40 hours per week. So very dangerous po yan. Ibig sabihin marami pong walang permanent and regular uh, na, na jobs kasi uh, yung mga manggagawang nagtatrabaho po ngayon ay dahil nga skeletal yung uh, workforce at rotation so 3 days lang sila nagtatrabaho pero hindi sapat yung kinikita nila therefore naghahanap pa po sila ng iba pang means ng pagkakakitaan yung iba po napupunta sa online na selling pagtitinda ng banana queue at mamaya po itong datos na ito ay crucial dun sa mga human story na i-feature po natin kasama po ni uh, Miss Mary Jane Labongray. Ang unemployed naman po, yung wala talagang trabaho ay 4,571,000 at ang kababaihan dyan ay 1.78 uh, million. Magandang makita po itong datos na to dahil maganda siyang ikumpara later on gaano ba karaming mga manggagawa sa kabuuan. Wala pong sex disaggregated data sa ngayon na makikita kung ilang mga kababaihan ang nakatanggap ng, ng ayuda, ng, ng SAP. Uh, compare pa lang dun sa datos ng mga kababaihan na nawalan ng, ng trabaho. So dun pa lang makikita po natin yung malaking discrepancy. Para po sa pagpapatuloy, nais ko pong tawagin si kasamang Mary Jane Labongray para po bigyan ng mukha at masubstantiate yung ibig sabihin po ng mga datos na ito. Maraming salamat po. Thank you, Ate Nice. Good morning po sa mga kasama. Ngayon po, uh, nakita natin yung malaking picture ng kalagayan ng mga kababaihan pagdating sa economic. Ngayon po ay ibabahagi ko sa inyo yung actual na karanasan ng mga kababaihan miyembro namin sa sentro. Ito po, na, ang kalagayan ng mga kababaihan sa ating ekonomi at ang kanilang mga istorya. Next slide, please. Yung... Hanggang Hunyo 2020 ay may 1.78 million ng mga kababaihan ang walang trabaho. Yan pong picture, makikita nyo po, yan po yung mga kababaihang halos, kababaihang natanggal sa export processing zone. Next slide, please. Ayon naman po sa datos na inilabas ng UN Women noong April 2020, may 6.6 million na mga kababaihan sa ating bansa ang nagtatrabaho sa informal na sektor. Yan naman po yung actual na litrato ng miyembro namin sa urban poor sa laban ng maralit ang sektor. Next slide please. Ito po sa export processing zone sa nagather naming istorya. Ito po si Ate Cherry ay member ay magagawa siya mula sa Corlanda Corporation. Single parent na tanggal sa trabaho. Ngayon, ang, ginaga, ang pinagkakakitaan niya ay pasabay. Ibig sabihin po ay kapag may mga kapitbahay or may kakilala siyang gusto magpabili, siya po ang uutusan at babayaran siya sa maliit na amount. At nagtitinda rin siya ng, dahil hindi sapat yung kinikita niya sa pasabay, nagtitinda siya ng banana queue, nag-online seller, Ayan po, sabay sa hala, sabay sabay po niyang ginagawa yung trabaho na yan dahil wala siyang natanggap na ayuda simula nung matanggal siya sa trabaho nung start pa lang ng lockdown. 
Ito naman po si kasamang Charmaine mula sa Global Wear ay nanay ng dalawang anak, 10 years na sa kumpanya, natanggal, tinanggal din po siya sa trabaho ng walang klarong dahilan. At nag, dahil natanggal siya sa trabaho, na, well, naghanap siya ng pagkakakitaan, nagnegosyo siya ng hot and cold water. Piso po yan kada isang baso. Sa gabi, nagtitinda siya ng crispy chicken dahil hindi sapat yung hot and cold water na negosyo niya. At yan, nakata nakatakda siya mag-file ng kaso sa October. Sa October. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Ito naman po si kasamang Edita mula din sa Global Wear. 55 years old na siya, 22 years na sa kampanya bilang sewer. Natanggal din po siya sa trabaho ng walang clarity kung anong dahilan. <coughs> At na, habang nasa gitna po ng ano, pandemic, <coughs> sorry. Yan, habang nasa gitna po ng pandemic, namatayan pa siya ng anak at wala siya natanggal, natanggap na burial assistant kahit na funeral assistant, monthly contribution sila sa company. At yan, meron ding hindi binayaran ng holiday pay, hindi binibigay ang ipinangako na separation pay. Hanggang ngayon po, nagmove on pa rin siya sa hirap ng dinanas ng family nila. Next slide. Ito naman po yung ano, kalagayan ng mga kasama naming domestic workers dito sa Pilipinas. Ito po, i-update ko lang po yung ano, datos na, na, kalag, na nalagay po dyan. Sa 2,784 po ng mga members namin sa United Domestic Workers, 1,072 po yung na-interview na -interview pa lang. Ang base po sa mga na-interview namin na 960 po yung mga nawala ng trabaho at 565 po dyan ay galing dito sa NCR. Yan po ay 89% pa lang mula sa 1,072 na na-interview. So, at uh, 52% agad po yung nawala ng trabaho sa mga kasambahay. Yan po. Next slide, please. Dito naman po sa mga kasama namin sa Hotel and Restaurants Union, lampas isang daan po yung nawala ng trabaho, karamihan ay casual and contractual workers. Karamihan din ay galing ay sa F&B and culinary at karamihan din sa mga manggagawa, no work, no pay arrangement. At nakakatanggap lang sila ng 1,000 to 2,000 na allowance per month. So, mas madami po yung walang pasok kaysa sa may pasok. So, yan, nakakaranas ng flexible time and rotation po. Next slide, please. Ito naman po yung karanasan ng mga kababaihan namin sa informal sector. <clears throat> Dito po sa Malabon pa lang po, 700 na nakababaihan yung nawala ng kita at hanap buhay. Karamihan sa kanila ay vendor, asawa ng driver, construction worker at iba pa kung saan nagagaling sa mga asawa nila yung pinangpupuhunan nila sa negosyo nila araw-araw. So marami sa kanila ay contractual worker, mga mananahe. Ayan. At ngayon dahil sa walang pinagkakitaan, problema nila yung bayarin at sa tubig at kuryente. Nabaon din yung karamihan sa kanila sa utang. Mayroon din hindi nakatanggap ng second chance na ayuda. At tinanggal din, mayroon din tinanggal ng mga manggagawa na hindi klaro kung ano yung dahilan. So yan po yung karanasan namin sa infor informal sector. Next slide please. At dito mo naman po sa sa mga kasama namin sa Cavite, sa mga kababaihan sa Cavite, 136 na kababaihang miyembro ay nawala ng kita at hanap buhay. Ang kanilang samahan ay may kabuang bilang na 855 na miyembro. Tinatayang 16% agad sa kanilang kasapian ang nawala ng hanap buhay. At 178 or 21% na miyembro ang hindi nakatanggap ng ayuda. Ito po ay datos mula noong August 2020 at inaasahan ko maas pa. Next slide please. Ito naman po yung kalagayan ng mga manggagawa namin sa transportasyon. 
halos 8,000 po yung membro namin sa National Confederation of Transport Union ang naapektuhan, ganun din yung kanilang mga pamilya. 170 na driver mahigit ang nawala ng hanap buhay mula sa transport cooperative namin sa Iloilo. Sa so, Cebu naman, merong mga kababaihang apat na women controller ang nawala ng trabaho at walo na office staff ang nawalan din ng trabaho. Yan po ay sa Iloilo pa lang tsaka sa Cebu. Next slide please. At ito po ay sa pahayag na nilabas ng Department of Labor and Employment. One million workers get dole cash aid. Pero mapapansin niyo po kanina sa presenta datos ni Ate Nice ay 16, 17 million ang mga magagawang kababayan. So kulang na kulang po yung, yung binigay na cash aid ng Department of Labor. Next slide please. Ito naman po yung mga kasama naming migrant domestic workers mula sa Hong Kong at Malaysia. Ito po sa mula sa datos na binigay ng Pro Progressive Labor Union sa Hong Kong. Sampo sa member ng PLU ang nawalan ng trabaho. Walo naman ang pinauwi ng Pilipinas. At hindi din binigyan ng ayuda yung pamilya nila kasi akala nila kapag nasa abroad ka, komportable yung buhay mo. Pero hindi ganoon yung reality. Ito naman po mula naman sa Ampo, Malaysia. 15 sa kanilang miyembro na wala ng trabaho. Tatlo ang pinauwi ng bansa. Di rin nabigyan ng ayuda maging yung pamilya. Kwento rin sa akin ng isang miyembro ay merong namamalimus na lang para, para pang renew ng visa nila. Yan, next slide. Ito po, dagdag pa sa amin pa yung uh, pambili ng kailangan sa pagbalik eskwela kasi di ba po hanggang ngayon wala pa rin clarity kung ano talaga yung plano ng Dep an Department of Education sa mga kabataan mo na kabataan na apektuhan yung dahil naapektuhan yung trabaho ng kanilang mga magulang maging yung mga kabataang estudyante na magbabalik eskwela ay naapektuhan din. So connected po yung mga problemang nararanasan ng mga kasama natin. So, tapos, alalahanin din natin yung kaligtasan ng pamilya sa panahon kung wala kang pera, hirap na talagang magkasakit. So, yun ang hirap maka-access ng maayos na na hospital ngayon or sa, pagdating sa kalusugan. Next slide, please. Um, dahil, ayun po na, narinig natin yung mga sitwasyon uh, o kalagayan ng mga kababaihang membro namin sa iba't ibang sektor. Ito po yung mga gusto nila or mga demands nila na gusto po nilang ipahatid sa inyo. Makabalik sa trabaho or balik trabaho ligtas, maibigay ang kulang na ayuda, magkaroon muli ng trabahong permanente, invest in public employment program, ayudang sapat para sa lahat, Magkaroon ng programa para sa panimulang puhunan para unti-unting makabangon. Mas okay kung sa forma ng kooperatiba. Makabiyahe ang kanilang mga asawang driver or, or gawing service contracting. May libreng gamot, swab testing at bakuna. May maayos at libreng PPEs, invest in care economy. Sige, sa punto pong ito, ibabalik ko po muna kay kasamang nights. Thank you po. Maraming salamat, Jay, no? Bilang nga uh, nagdagdag po dun sa uh, binahagi ni si Jay, napakahalaga po ng mga storya na binahagi niya sapagkat yun po yung mga uh, refleksyon ng mga dapat na binahagi natin. So, dun po kanina sa storya ng mga migrant workers, uh, katatapos lang po namin asikasuhin po uh, yung isang kasama namin mula sa Hong Kong na isa sa mga bumalik dito at kasama sa datos po na pinesent namin. Kamakailan ay uh, nakakuha na po siya ng employer sa sa Hong Kong, ngunit isa po sa mga requirement ay dapat po nakakapag-testing, uh, no? nakapag-swab testing siya. At ang resulta po na naibigay uh, sa kanya ng lung center ay uh, positive. At uh, yun po yung na-inform ng uh, lung center uh, sa kanyang agency. Subalit, uh, uh, nagkaroon ng pagkakamali ang lung center. Ito naman daw po ay, ang resulta naman daw po ng kanyang testing ay uh, negative uh, talaga. Kaya umapela po ang uh, 
uh, amin pong uh, miyembro sa kanyang uh, agency para i-confirm muli sa kanyang employer. Ngunit uh, huli na po ang lahat, ito ay nagresulta na hindi na po tinuloy ng employer yung kontrata pero naniniwala po kami na uh, hindi po pagkakamali ng uh, aming uh, miyembro yung yung nangyari. No? So, ganyan po yung nararanasan pa ng iba nating mga migrant workers kasi two years po ng kanyang hanap buhay yung uh, nawala at uh, patuloy po ngayon ang, ang kaso para po sa aming demand uh, na makuha niya po yung mga ginagast, ginastos niya po sa pag-file ng case. Uh, halaga po nga uh, 54,000 po yung ginastos niya pero kung susumahin po yung total contract ay 630,000 yon Bilang pagtatapos po, gusto namin pag bigyang the end, yung pag-invest po sa public employment uh, program. Nakita nyo naman kanina, no? kahit marami ng mga manggagawang kasambahay ang nawalan ng trabaho, ang average na income po nila ay 5,000 pesos per month. So, napakaliit pa din po niyan. Ibig sabihin po niyan, reflection po yan na napakaliit ng tingin uh, sa gawain uh, sa loob ng, ng tahanan kahit ito ay napakahirap kung saan maraming mga kababaihang manggagawa mas maliit po ang uh, kanilang sahod. Doon po sa public employment uh, program one, nananawagan po kami katulad po ng nagkais sa labor coalition na income guarantees at ayulang sapat po para sa, sa lahat equivalent to the prevailing minimum wage of 10,000 per month whichever is higher for those unable to work due to lockdown conditions. Two, wage subsidies equivalent to 75% of the prevailing minimum wage to save jobs, workers, and micro, medium, and small enterprises. Three, employment guarantees for those who are unemployed, ranging from 100 days to 9 months, and we want a gender quota. Fourth, Training for strategic employment facilitation with stipend of not less than 50% of minimum wages. And lastly po, expansion of the public sector to take on social tasks such as upgrading the public health system, developing renewable energy, and carrying out mitigation and adaptation measures to climate change. Maraming salamat po. Marami salamat din, Nice at Mary Jane. So nakikita po natin na kahit hindi gaanong uh, sex and gender disaggregated yung mga national data natin, napupunan ito uh, progressively no, ng mga labor and women labor organizations on the ground. So napaka-importante ipagpatuloy at kumplituhin itong proseso. Now before we move to our um, other CSOs who will make an input uh, and then to our government agency, silingin ko sa iyo, Com Sec Gigi, paki-acknowledge lang yung mga bagong dating natin sa ating hearing. Yes, ma'am. Uh, for the record, we'd like to acknowledge our additional resource persons from the Department of Foreign Affairs, Office of the Undersecretary for Migrant Workers Affairs. We have uh, Director Jeronimo Soligin Jr. Um, and Acting Director Angela Tolentino. From the Commission on Filipinos Overseas, we have Director Marin Marita Apatad, Project uh, Management Division. Uh, from the Philippine Statistics Authority, we have Mr. Jason Conti. And from the Center for Migrant Advocacy, we have Ms. Elena Sana. That's all, Madam Chair. Salamat, Comsec Gigi. Okay, so uh, pakinggan naman natin yung ibang mga CSOs natin. Hilingin ko lang sa mga kasama sa civil society orgs kung maaring lim tig limang minuto para may oras din tayong marinig at makausap yung ating government agencies. So we will hear from uh, UN Women, UNICEF, uh, CATWAP, Lagablab, CMA, UNHCR, at saka Oxfam. So could I please uh, give the floor to the, uh, the source person from UN Women? Yes, um, magandang umaga, Senator Risa. Yes, Ms. Cha. Honorable Senator, Senator Amy, Senator Nancy, and to everyone, mga kasama, um, we will make this short. I don't know if I, I will be allowed to share my screen, uh, but just to uh, share with you that for you and women, uh, we have four areas that we're working on, women, peace and security, uh, women's economic empowerment, uh, women's access to justice, and gender and humanitarian action. And um, my colleagues are here with me. Uh, so I just want to acknowledge them as well. Um, Len Len for We Empower Asia for Women's Economic Empowerment. Jonah for Women's Access to Justice. And um, 
kami uh, at least for uh, uh, gender humanitarian action and just to show you um this recommendation on uh we prepared a gender snapshot and uh we also shared a copy um to the uh, uh office of senator Risa Tavares. um i don't know if i'm allowed to share my screen but otherwise um Yes, um, here, I, do you see my screen now? Okay, so uh, this is a very uh, straightforward recommendation from the side of UN Women. So we just wanted to highlight that there's a disruption to essential services for survivors, including, including disruption of the business sector. And we acknowledge and recognize that we have many women who are in the business and in small micro enterprises, small and medium micro enterprises, we have women who are deprived of liberty and women who are affected already with um, humanitarian situation, including in Bangsamoro. So we wanted to highlight um, these um, strategies and recommendations to address and to recognize um, from the rapid assessments on the impact of COVID-19 on women, including women in business and MSMEs, women deprived of liberty, women migrant workers, Bangsamoro women, women in a formal economy. And when we talk about services, UN Women is um, providing technical assistance, especially to our women in businesses and MSMEs. We are also working with um, the justice sector, especially for women deprived of liberty, especially women in conflict. Uh, with the law and um, also women in informal economy and women in Bangsamoro uh, moral uh, communities. Uh, psychological support is very important. Shelter and outlines are very important, but we also want to highlight the um, need to increase women's access to technology at this point in relation to uh, women's economic empowerment, women's um, access to services, the means really we find is the access to technology and we want to um this is, will be the core message um we hope that systems will be updated policies are developed and protocols to provide essential services within the humanitarian development nexus are in place provide technical support for covid 19 response referrals case management especially for women migrant workers uh, we want to know how the coordination with the Philippine embassies back to our home country, to the national, up to the local um, levels. And we also want to highlight that we, we empower Asia, the Women's Economic Empowerment Program of the UN Women. We are um, providing support in developing sexual harassment prevention and as well as in relation to uh, the businesses. Uh, we will share this. Of course, uh, but uh, we just want to uh, share to everyone, especially to our Senate committee, that uh, UN Women is very open, and we hope to also walk you through with further details of our recommendation based on the gender snapshot that we have um, prepared in terms of the situation of women in the Philippines in different areas of a concern. So thank you very much, Senator Risa, and thank you um, to the uh, Office of Senator Risa Tavares and to the Senate Committee on Gender Equality. Thank you very much also, Ms. Cha. Now I'd like to give the floor to UNICEF for your um, uh, input. Yes, Sir Paul, you have the floor. Sir Paul, parang naka-mute kayo. Paki-unmute. Di pa rin namin kayo marinig. Sir Paul, if it's okay, I'll call uh, the uh, catwalk first and then come back to you. Baka pwede nyo kung ayusin lang muna yung audio nyo. Okay, sir. I, I think I see you raising your eyebrows, so I, I'm sure that it's yes. I'll, I'll come back to Sir Paul. Okay. Uh, I'd like to give the floor now to Katwap, Asia Pacific, uh, Executive Director Jean Enriquez. Jean, you have the floor. 
Thank you so much, Madam Chair, Your Honor. We are happy about the inclusion of the often invisible abuse of prostituted women in your resolution to conduct an inquiry in aid of legislation on the gender dimensions of the crisis. I will just be sharing additional emphasis on gendered impacts of the crisis and the responses of local governments. Hopefully our work as well that might help uh, in the course of uh, crafting legislation and finally uh, concrete recommendations. Uh, first, we would want to say that it is important to note that national policies and pronouncements have impact on both gender impacts also, on the very specific impacts to women, and LGU effectivity in responding to gender needs. In addition to what have been presented, I also want to emphasize that not only did the crisis magnify gender inequality, but also among women, class differences. Women in urban poor communities, uh, has, has, has been said, starved with their children, which also resulted in their greater vulnerability to prostitution in the hands of those who have mobility and who have and who can contact them? These are men in uniform. Others access them online. We personally know women who had suicidal ideation because of what has happened. Needless to say, many in the, of the women in the informal sector also lost livelihood. And even those who are employed had no transportation to be able to go to their jobs. But with the help of survivors organizations on the ground, we managed to deliver immediate food relief especially in the first weeks of the lockdown. It might be useful to look into the research of Michelle Castillo of UPNC PAG. In April 2020, on gendered approach to local COVID management in the Philippines. To paraphrase the vulnerabilities of women from indigenous peoples, survivors of prostitution and other forms of violence, survivors of war on drugs, migrants who returned, and those residing in informal settlements are multiplied as they face discrimination in accessing government assistance. They were bypassed in the distribution of relief packages, especially if they are not registered residents or voters in the communities. With no alternative sources of income, they were forced to say yes to police who offer them food and money in exchange for sex. Two, in terms of uh, cases of VAW, it has been said that there was lower reporting during pandemic, despite our knowledge that VAW increases during crisis given loss of income, greater tension within households, and pre-existing conditions of gender violence and discrimination. So there was difficulty in accessing help. It might be useful to cite how CSOs did uh, everything in their capacity to respond to this. Uh, for example, um, CATWAP, in cooperation with the United Nations Population Fund, conducted remote trainings with city or municipal local government units and barangay local government units, especially in BARM, to continue to capacitate local government responders on rights-based, survivor-centered, and gender-responsive approaches to all forms of GBV. We also uh, informed the public through public service announcements and stickers on hygiene kits that, that Barangay VAW desks continue to be active during the crisis. We helped popularize the CHR gender portal and the PNP WCPC hotlines other than local hotlines that we proved to be working. Still with UNFPA, we have developed digitized modules on GBV laws, VAW desk functionality, and rights-based approach to GBV. So here are our uh, recommendations in relation to policy frameworks and LGU responses. Jean, if I may interject. Sorry. Oh, I think si Sen, it's okay. But I think Sen Aimee would like to raise a point about uh, your ongoing presentation, if I may. Sen Aimee, sure. please. Uh, Sen Aimee, naka-mute ka. Paki-unmute. Oh, uh, my mistake, uh, mga kasama. Sorry, Jean. I think uh, Sen Aimee is uh, interjecting in another hearing as well. Please continue. Uh -oh. Okay, Paul. So the implementation of SAP uh, should ensure or prioritize women in the most vulnerable situations, particularly women who are solo parents, 
uh, those working in informal economies with disabilities, HIV positive persons, survivors of prostitution and other gender-based violence, also elderly women. The burden for LGUs in areas that are affected by conflict or in post-disaster recovery stage are even doubled, given the dire situation of government services and heightened insecurity insecurity. Nonetheless, the basic necessities, health and security of internally displaced women and female refugees should not be sidelined. Um, cash assistance and relief packages should also prioritize low-income households headed by women. LGUs can also consider providing cash assistance to households that are dependent on remittances of relatives who are OFWs who are laid off or cannot send money at home temporarily. Uh, we just want to cite that some LGUs were able to pre-position also binhi or vegetable seeds as early as January, which the people in Mama Sapano, for example, were able to access. Um, however, Balik Provincia should have been better thought of uh, because of lack of sustainable livelihood in the rural areas. And because of long quarantine requirements, there were returnees who escaped uh, the quarantine areas to be able to earn. Um, definitely, there should be transparency and relief distribution. Distribution. Women were kept in the dark on how this really, what really is the policy or the guidelines in terms of distribution. It's important to emphasize eliminating patronage in relief distribution and provision of livelihood. It was good that the DILG issued advisory on the functionality or that the fact that Barangay Valda should be active during uh, the crisis uh, as early as April 2. Um, it, we have to note that uh, as LG responders are overburdened, uh, overburdened, uh, VAW response definitely cannot take a back seat as it is also life-saving. Uh, we commend the PASIG uh, LGU for providing transportation, transportation for HIV positive persons to be able to access antiretroviral drugs. And this is uh, a move that should be replicated in other LGUs. We emphasize the need to include women CSOs participation in planning, monitoring and implementation of crisis responses. And this hearing definitely is a major step towards that direction. So in terms of legislation, it's important to uh, perhaps facilitate CSO's work instead of impeding it with bureaucratic registration, as, has, uh, as was initially released uh, by DSWD early during the lockdown. Finally, uh, greater national assistance to local governments in terms of funds and general vision and not penalizing local governments that take initiative on responding to the most vulnerable women would be greatly appreciated. Thank you, Madam Chair. Okay. Thank you, Rin. Thank you, Rin Jean. At okay, pwede ko bang balikan ng UNICEF? Sir Paul, are you back with us? All right. Oh, yes, you are. Sir? Naririnig na po? Yes, naririnig namin kayo. Please proceed. You have the floor. Naririnig na po ba? Naririnig na po. Please proceed. Okay. Maraming pong salamat. Uh, uh, thank you po. Magandang umaga po sa ating lahat. Ako po si Paul De Lusario. Ako isang WASH specialist. At the same time, gender focal point sa UNICEF. Pin po si Rowena Daxig, ang aming PISEA coordinator. Uh, magbabahagi lang kami ng ilang Thoughts also from UNICEF uh, in relation to this uh, policy. Uh, can, pwede po bang i-share yung aking presentation? Si Joanna ba mag-share? On your end, uh, Sir Paul, you, you may proceed. You to share. Okay po. Tadali lang. Yan. So, sa amin po sa UNICEF, uh, wait lang po. Nakikita po ba yung presentation? Yes, sir. Nakikita po. Nakikita. Uh, so sa, sa amin po sa UNICEF, ang una namin ginawa when this pandemic started, naglabas yung aming, uh, uh, yung aming headquarters ng isang technical note to ensure that, that uh, yung technical note was supposed to guide us on how we would be implementing our COVID-19 responses all over the world, including in the Philippines. Ang objective nung aming technical, nung aming, uh, technical note in terms of gender, kagaya rin ng mga nabanggit na nung sa iba, ensuring that gender equality is, would always be in the heart of our response. 
<coughs> uh, pa, dun sa technical note na yun, meron kaming limang uh, uh, actions na inire-recommend na i-consider sa aming mga responses. Una, yung aming care for the caregivers. Uh, uh, when we say care caregivers, we refer to the frontliners, particularly women in the front lines. And at the same time, yung uh, women who are also taking care of the households. Yung mga kababaihan na naiwan para alagaan ng mga may sakit, ang kanilang pamilya habang dumadaan tayo sa isang napakahirap na panahon. Uh, yung pangalawa, yung preparing for the increase in, in GBV cases. So, uh, nabanggit na rin naman kanina na talaga namang in-expect na uh, tataas ang kaso ng ang GBP habang nasa quarantine period ang maraming lugar. Kaya uh, tinitiyak namin na dapat nakahanda mga sistema para tumugon doon sa increase ng GBP. Yung pangalawa, ay yung pangatlo, yung aming maintaining core uh, yung, uh, core actions in terms of uh, core health and educational services systems. Sa amin kasi sa UNICEF, alam namin magbabago yung yung priority, syempre, ang uunahin yung COVID, pero sana hindi rin matigil yung pagbibigay ng priority doon sa iba pang aspeto ng uh, ng ng health, education, and protection services. Yung pang-apat, siguraduhin pa rin na uh, habang kami ay nagre-respond sa COVID-19, ay na-engage pa rin yung mga kababayan at youth groups, lalong-lalo na yung mga nasa komunidad. Uh, kasama dito, yung tiyake na mayroong uh, may information flow pa rin, uh, kung kinakailangan uh, yung connectivity issues, ay tingnan para tiyake yung engagement nila ay palaging nandun. At yung pangungle, basic po, nabanggit na rin ng marami kaninang speaker, ay yung gender and data Uh, datos ay dapat available, analyzed, and acted on. Uh, mula dito sa limang five priority actions namin, uh, uh, meron kaming ilang mga nakita so far uh, in the more than six months that we were under lockdown. Una, mukhang limited at uh, mababa pa yung understanding at recognition doon sa triple role ng mga kababaihan uh, mula dito sa pinagdadaanan nating COVID-19 both at the home and community level. Actually, triple role yung nangyari sa mga kababaihan dahil dito sa pandemya ito. Yung mga kababaihan ay, kadala, ay kadalasan, karamihan sa kanila ay also gumagampan ng mga frontline work. Halimbawa, yung mga barangay health worker, BNH, yung mga miyembro ng birth, karamihan ng mga yan ay kababaihan. Pero yung yung kanilang protection, yung kanilang uh, contribution para sa, uh, sa pagpigil ng pandemya ito ay hindi masyadong napapansin. At the same time, may mga kababayahan din na patuloy kagaya may nung, nung mga speakers kanina no? may mga kababayahan na patuloy pa rin talagang kailangan lumabas ng bahay, maghanap buhay magtrabaho pero uh, yung support para sa kanila habang uh, nilalagay nila yung kanilang mga buhay sa panganib kasi kailangan nilang lumabas at magtrabaho pa rin ay hindi masyadong mapipigyan ng pansin at yung panguli, kagaya rin ng marami ng nabanggit kanina ng mga speakers yung unpaid care work uh, ng, ng mga kababaihan habang dumadaan tayo sa isang napakahirap na, na, na punto sa ating mga buhay yung pangatlo ay yung pangalawa namin na pansin ay yung reinforcement, reinforcement ng mga trad, uh, traditional gender norm. Mukhang yung mga mensaheng lumalabat, maganda naman, maayos naman, kaya lang mukhang traditional pa rin na talaga ang tuto, kagaya nga ng nabanggit ni Senator uh, Amy Marcos kanina, yung mga nanay pa rin, mga nanay pa rin, mga kababaihan pa rin. Yung, yung at yung isa pa rin namin napansin ay mukhang limitado yung representation ng mga kababayan sa mga decision-making processes. Yung tingnan na lang natin kung sino ba yung mga nagdidesisyon, yung mga bodies na in charge of decision-making, talagang bilang na bilang lang yung mga babaeng represented sa mga bodies na yun. Yung pangatlo, uh, uh, very specific to gender-based violence, mukhang inadequate pa rin yung attention ay binibigay sa GBP. Uh, may mukhang may issue sa data collection, reporting and sharing. Uh, parang kailangan pa yatang sinsinin ilan mga, uh, ano nga, tuma, tumatas nga ba yung kato ng GPP, uh, paayos pa yung reporting system at ibabahagi ba talaga ito sa publiko. Yung, uh, pang, yung isa pang punto rito ay mukhang kailangan pa talagang itaas yung kakayahan ng ating mga first responders, lalong lalo na yung mga nasa community level on how to deal with GBB cases kasama na yung referral system. And then, of course, yung, pang, yung panghuli ay yung access to GBB services na mukha talagang nalipi, lim, nalimitahan dahil din sa mga lockdowns na ipinatupad. Halimbawa, uh, either yung mga GBB, uh, yung provider ng GBB services ay hindi makalabas na kanilang magbahay para ihatid ang servisyong kailangan ng mga GBB Uh, survivors, at the same time yung mga GBB survivors naman, hindi rin makalabas ng kanilang magbabahay para pumunta at kumuha ng servisyong kailangan nila. 
So dahil po dito, may ilan din kami ilang uh, gusto sanang ihain na rekomendasyon. Una, sana yung recognizing and creating supportive environment for women. Uh, mukhang kailangan talaga i-increase yung protection for women workers, particularly those in the in the front line at the community level. Yung atin pong mga BHW, mga birds, uh, sa totoo lang, kahit yung simpleng uh, PPE, ay kulang na kulang sila. Wala. Umiikot sila para tingnan na kalagay sino ang COVID positive, yung mga uh, yung mga COVID patients sa kanila kanilang mga barangay pero kahit basic PPE minsan ay kulang na kulang pa sila wala silang training na tatatang sapat na training na tatanggap para gampanan yung kanilang tungkulin mukhang kailangan suportahan yung ating mga local government unit para makapagbigay din sila ng suporta dun sa ating mga women frontliners at the at the community level. Siguro okay na yung mga nasa hospital, mga nasa clinic, mukhang yan, nabibigyan ng atensyon. Pero yung mga nasa community level, mukhang kailangan pa ng dagdag na tulong. Yes. Yung pangalawa pong ensure that women are benefiting from entitlement. So yung mga nagtatrabaho po, sana kanina napanggit, may mga hindi tang tumanggap ng separation pay, etc. So sana yung mga entitlements na yun, so para sa mga kababayang patuloy pa rin nagtatrabaho, Uh, at uh, para ma- ma- tuloy, uh, tumulong sa pagbuhay ng kanilang mga pamilya. Thank you, ma'am. Thank para din marinig din natin yung iba. Salamat po. Please proceed. Okay, salamat po. Kanina nabanggit na rin po, ano, so sana mag- magbigay din tayo ng cash-based intervention doon sa mga unpaid care work ng women. In a, uh, not just women, pero meron din kami tinatawag na child and single-headed households or families. Iniisip namin, baka pwedeng yung TSWD, pwedeng ilink up sa ilang programa nila para mabigyan din naman ng pansin yung mga unpaid care work. Uh, increase advocacy and awareness to change the digital der- uh, gender norms. Uh, more space, sana dagdagan pa yung meaningful participation ng women. Uh, baka kailangan natin i-review at expand pa yung mga parenting messages na binibigay natin sa publiko to target both mothers and fathers, even single parents and adults and mothers. And then yung sa GBB, napanggit na rin ito kanina, uh, dagdagan pa yung Uh, training, scaling up the training of community level, uh, of responders at the community level, and then at the same time, nabagitin ito kanina, increasing availability of GBB services despite the quarantine measures. Yun lang po, ilang uh, mong kahi lang po mula sa UNICEF. Maraming salamat po. Maraming salamat din, Sir Paul, at sa UNICEF. Ngayon, uh, let's hear from Lagablab through Attorney Claire. Maganda umaga po, sir. Yes, yeah, Maganda umaga floor. po. Thank you po, Senator Risa. Uh, we also thank the Committee on Women, Children, uh, Family Relations, and Gender Equality for inviting us to participate in this. Uh, I'm from Lagablab Network, a coalition of organizations advocating and lobbying for LGBTQI responsive policies and legislation. We have been documenting uh, reported incidents of discrimination, harassment, and violence against LGBTQI Filipinos in the context of the pandemic. In general, LGBTQI Filipinos have become more vulnerable to discrimination, harassment, and violence uh, in the government responses to the pandemic. So this includes lockdowns, checkpoints, arrests in the context of curfew violations, and access to economic support from local government. Young LGBTQI Filipinos, um, particularly trans youth, are greatly affected by the limited mobility during quarantine. They are also more susceptible to abuse and to mental health problems during this time. They are unable to express themselves in the presence of their family members who they are quarantined with uh, without exposing themselves to harm and to abuse. Uh, LGBTQI-led households are often not recognized as families, thereby excluding them from access to, to government support. Um, while we welcome the announcement of some local government units that LGBTQ couples with children shall be considered as families for the purpose of their social amelior- amelioration program, we note that most often these policies would still not include LGBTQI families without children or other forms of non-traditional families. But what's alarming are reports of harassment and violence against LGBTQI persons during the quarantine, 
particularly against trans women and LGBTQI youth. There are several reports of some public officials who have imposed inhumane penalties on LGBTQI persons arrested in the context of the quarantine. So just to give some illustrative cases, in one incident, a transgender woman who posted her sentiments regarding the L their LGU's COVID response was taken to the Barangay Hall and she was forced to take a drug test and to live stream an apology on Facebook. In uh, in another incident, a trans woman, trans women, sorry, trans women who were arrested for violating curfew were made to perform lewd acts with a minor. And this was live streamed on Facebook. And there were also other reports of uh, inhumane punishments against LGBTQI persons, uh, including hair being cut and their head being shaved. So these narratives of discrimination, harassment, and violence against LGBTQI persons, um, that they're, they're, that LGBTQI persons are experiencing in the context of the pandemic, ne these need to be surfaced, documented, and heard. And these need to be addressed. In a time when all of us are vulnerable, protection must be available and accessible to each of us, regardless of our gender and regardless of our sexual orientation, gender identity, or gender expression. Yun lamang po. Maraming salamat po. Maraming salamat din, Attorney Claire at Lagab Lab. Now, could we please hear from uh, Center for Migrant Advocacy through Executive Director Ellen Sana? Ayun, Thank Ellen, you, Chair. You Thank you, Chair. Uh, uh, thank you, Senator Risa, at magandang umbago po sa ating lahat dito sa committee ng Senado. Sa bahagi po ng ating mga OFWs, at kami rin po ay nais magpahayag from the Center for Migrant Advocacy. As we all know, meron po tayong tinatawag na feminization of uh, labor migration, wherein we have more women now migrating for work purposes kaysa sa mga kalalakihan. In fact, in the 2019 data of the PSA, 56% po ng OFWs natin ay kababaihan. So that translates to more than 1 million OFW na kababaihan compared to 44% ng mga kalalakihan. Ang mas malaking issue po doon is the fact that uh, out of these women migrant workers, 62.5% po ang ating mga nasa domestic work. At again, alam natin na red flag yun na yung vulnerability ng ating mga nasa manggagawang nasa loob ng bahay. At ang isa ring significant na bilang 17.7% ay nasa sales and services sector. And again, we can imagine, especially in this uh, COVID-19 pandemic, na kung ang iyong trabaho ay non-essential, ay ikaw ay mas malamang hindi na nakakapagtrabaho ngayon. So the impact of COVID is really deep and, and far-ranging and, and it impacts not only on the migrant themselves but on the families as well. So ang um, isa hong dahilan kung bakit pa rin despite the vulnerability of doing domestic work overseas, isang dahilan din ay dahil yung ating labor force participation ay kitabangit na punto ng naunang grupo nila, nila na sa sentro, napakaliit din. Um, less than uh, 50% ng ating women workers ay nakalahok sa labor force sa Pilipinas. Last year, 53.4% po ng women workers natin ay wala sa labor force. At ang isang pangunahing dahilan ay dahil sila ay nagagawa ng kanilang household duties, pagtatrabaho sa bahay, pag-aalaga ng bata, pag-aalaga ng matanda. Which, if you will translate, those unpaid care work, three-fourths of which are done by women sa bahay, ay 1.875 trillion pesos po, base sa pag-aaral ng PIDS. So they go abroad and they do the same job, pero meron po silang uh, sweldo, pero kakonti po, isa sa pinakang mababang uh, uh, pasweldo ay sa domestic workers. So sa panahon po ng pandemia, ang ilan sa mga interventions na ginagawa po ng CMA, syempre yung regular pong programa ng pagpapasilitate ng assistance. May mga kaso tayo na as early as February, may order ng POEA na i-rescue at i-repatriate yung, yung domestic workers natin sa Saudi, inabot ng lockdown kaka-repatriate lang po niya nitong September. So can you imagine, from September, before September, eh, meron na siyang naranasan na pagmamaltrato, nagpatong-patong, September pa lamang siya nakauwi. At marami po ang gano'n na sitwasyon. In other cases, ayaw sana nila umuwi dito sa Pilipinas kasi alam nila na, marami, na wala rin trabaho dito, kaso lang hindi nila na-anticipate na prolong itong magiging epekto ng pandemya, they get stranded, they get stuck in the countries of destination, na wala na po yung kanilang mga trabaho, na wala yung kanilang mga visas to, to, to work, to be allowed to work in those countries. Kaya at least sila na pwede silang hulihin. Kasi katulad sa ibang lugar sa, sa Middle East, 
like uh, Saudi Arabia and uh, Oman, wala silang uh, amnesty na declare. So if you lose your legal status, you're at risk of being arrested. So dito po sa kalagayan na ito ng, mga ka, ng ating mga WFWs, sa bahagi po ng CMA, yung casework namin, itong January to June, ay nakapagtala kami, nakareceive po kami ng request for, for assistance from distressed workers ay 39 po yung mga kalalakihan at overwhelmingly yung mga bahay po ang mas maraming humihingi ng pag-assiste kung paano sila maiibsan yung kalagayan nila, mostly on-site. So more than 120 cases, individual cases po yung nabigyan namin ng pansin ngayong uh, January to June. And then may group uh, area at ang marami din dito ay mga kulang ang pasweldo, hindi na po ang gratuity or hindi na pinasweldo. So yun yung mga ating mga, mga kababayan na around 366 po yung aming natanggap na request na i-follow up sana, ipaabot uli ulitin sa 195 na kalalakihan po sa Dole Aki. Ang isa din, pag may mga kaso ng, na kailangan i-rescue or i-contact sa labas, dahil kulang din ang ating mga personal complement submissions, at may mga panapanong they have to close down the offices kasi yung kanilang personnel ay meron ding na epekto kahit nasa gitna ng, ng pandemya na ito. So uh, given that, sa bahagi po ng, um, sa usapin ng pangkalusugan, sa usapin ng seafarers kasi, kasama din po yun, we do research at Jordan, sa Lebanon, at sa Saudi Arabia, and we would be happy to furnish the committee with the results of uh, that research. At the same time, mm -hmm. apart from the direct services, kami po ay gumagawa ng iba't ibang capacity building na banggit ang importansya ng LGU engagement. We've been in, uh, engaging with uh, our local government uh, training for our BARM um, partners, BARM and Region 10 and 11 and 13, kasama yung mga areas sa Mindanao. Matatapos na po ang aming paralegal, training on paralegal and access to justice. Uh, Baroon sila ng dagdag na kaalaman at saka skills on how they can uh, facilitate assistance to their distress or FW constituents. At kasama nga dito yung pagiging conscious na ang ating mga apektadong uh, sektor ay lalaki at babae. And this is where, for example, we utilize the 16 uh, guidelines, basic principles and guidelines to rendering quality service to victim survivors gender based na ay mabigyan ng mas marami burden sa household ng mga kalalakihan at ibang members ng pamilya kasi doon yung isang malaking dahilan kung bakit sila hindi lali when they take the migration option so bigyan ng skills training upgrade yung kanilang mga kakanyahan especially post covid so dapat ay klaro yung na yung information na to na nagfo-flow doon sa ating providers doon sa ating mission sa Polo sa OWA dapat ay tama yung kanilang pag pag uh, implementa nitong mga programa na to. Sino yung mag-a-avail, paano mag-a-avail, ano yung coverage. Kasi po sa aming karanasan ay mayroong gaps. So pag na-call namin yung attention, ay saka lang nagkakaroon ng, ng intervention. So maganda po na immediately ay klaro sa lahat ng miyembro na nagpapatupad ng mga patakaran kung ano talaga yung, yung detalye ng, ng programa kasi nagkakaroon ng confusion. Uh, pangatlo po ay mahalaga po ang ayuda. Ito po, uh, lalo sa emergency situation, uh, we definitely have to think of the short-term, medium, long-term uh, program for, for job and, and employment of our people, skills upgrading, pero mahalaga po sa panahon ngayon, nagmamater din ng ayuda. In our little way, nakakapag-facilitate kami ng pagbibigay ng ayuda sa ilang, sa, sa UAE in particular, mga food packs, at magsisimula po kami ngayon sa, sa pagbibigay din ng kaunti dito sa, sa, sa atin. Pero I think yun nga, yung equality din ng opportunity at access kasi feeling talaga ng mga, mga nagbibigay ng ayuda dito sa atin, LGU man o DSWD, ay mas maiigi ang, karap, ang kalagayan ng ating mga OFW families. Yun po ay hindi necessarily true, especially nga dahil ang mga may pamilyang naiiwanan dito are usually the low-wage workers. And the reason they are left behind in the Philippines, in the country, is because they cannot afford to bring their family members in their country of destination. So, kung sila nag no work, no pay, o na-display sa trabaho, lalo po silang kawa. Mahirap din. So, ayuda can go a long way and it will be really appreciated. So, siguro po, katulad din ng iba, dagdag na, na, na recommendation, take them on board. The migrants, but also the women migrants in particular. Hindi lang sa usapin ng being recipients 
of the programs and services of our government, whether at the national or at the local, but as part of the the the, the body that will decide and define and identify what programs and services we would need at this time the the, the pandemic. So yun lang po at maraming salamat. Maraming salamat din, Ellen, at sa CMA. Um, I'll give the floor now to the resource person from the UN, Office of the UN High Commissioner on Refugees. Sino po yung magsasalita para sa UN uh, HCR? Hello po, magandang umaga. Ms. Ariel, uh, yes, you have the floor. This is, thank you so much, ma'am. Um, uh, magandang uh, umaga po and maramang salamat po for the opportunity to be part of this discussion to our esteemed senators, uh, the committee, as well as our um, colleagues from our government and civil society. Um, for us, po, we would just like to share that um, as the uh, refugee agency of the United Nations, po, no, part of our mandate is ensuring the right to access citizenship. And we want to highlight how um, citizenship and um, documentation to prove your citizenship through a birth certificate is still as relevant now, especially in view of the pandemic. Especially this could mean access to um, rights and services. So this could mean life and death for many of our stateless persons and our at-risk populations. And I just want to touch up on um, one of the state-identified, meaning the Philippines has identified this in a series of roundtable discussions as one of the at-risk populations that they may be um, further left behind if we are not addressing their um, risk of statelessness through birth registration. Are those children of um, uh, Filipino descent, meaning of OFWs, uh, especially in the Middle East, uh, 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 especially in the Middle East, um, as sh shared po, no, by Director uh, Eileen, um, the feminization of labor meant a lot of female OFWs and the situation, especially in the Middle East, is rather dire. Um, based on the 2011 um, Committee on Overseas Workers Affairs report, um, these OFWs face several protection challenges, like for example, yung ikatama or yung resident certificate. Um, without this, they're unable to go to the hospital and register their birth. And even with this ikama, if, um, for example, the child is born out of wedlock or born out of rape, um, or walang marriage certificate, yung individual, no, yung mother, um, the child, uh, the mother could be detained or deported, and loss of livelihood na puyon for the OFW. And of of course, the gender-based violence is there. And for the child, he is or she may be further left behind and may be unable to further access um, services like education and healthcare by virtue of this lack of um, birth certificate. And this was actually validated in the 2017 discussion paper of the Council for the Welfare of Children um, in Saudi Arabia. Um, they highlighted how um, children in these settings are in a position of triple vulnerability. Apart from being children, of course, we also consider the gender component. Um, they're also migrants and they're also undocumented and they are at risk of poverty, social exploitation, exclusion, discrimination nation and exploitation and of course this also has implications in terms of mobility and their safety and security so um and while these studies are not in the context of um, the pandemic um these risks are further heightened in view of these restrictions due to covid19 and for us for no we also um uh, would like to recommend that they, to ensure that they are not left behind, to ensure more inclusive programs and inclusion in data collection systems because, of course, we recognize how data collection can guide um, policy and programming, especially for these vulnerable populations. And just to um, reinforce the statement of our colleague earlier, um, we also want to recommend the inclusion of our female refugees and stateless persons because um, right now, although we don't have a study on this, we regularly monitor the situation of these um, individuals and um, based on our monitoring um, in consultation also in coordination with the Philippine government, there are issues in terms of accessing services and also um, uh, movement, freedom of movement as well. And um, we recognize that the Philippines has obligations to protect these individuals under the relevant international conventions like the 1951 um, Refugee 
G Convention and the 1954 Statelessness Convention, and even in the um, national frameworks of the Philippines, like the National Action Plan to End Statelessness and the Philippine Development Plan, which includes Chapter 11 on addressing statelessness as one of the priorities. Um, so from UNHCR's end, we... Um, we commend this endeavor for the committee to pursue the protection of these vulnerable individuals. And we would like to express our support and technical um, uh, and assurance to extend technical assistance on um, how we could better um, ensure that no one um, is left behind. Um, that is all for me. And thank you so much for this opportunity. Paul. Okay. Thank you so much also, Ms. Ariel, at uh, UN uh HCR. We'll hear from two more CSOs and then we'll finally get to our government agencies. Uh, humihingi ako ng paumanihin sa aking mga kasama sa gobyerno, sa executive. Alam ko pong tanghali na but I'm sure as each one of us can appreciate. Uh, napaka hindi lang malawak pero napakalalim at um, complex talaga nitong realidad na mas inaalam natin and I'm sure everyone uh, around the table even at this time uh, is confident that armed with this additional knowledge and sensitivity, uh, maraming maipapanganak ito na partnerships among us to uh, provide a more complete policy framework and therefore programs uh, para sa ating mga kababaihan at kabataan. So I thank my colleagues uh, in government, particularly from the government agencies, executive for your uh, continued patience. But we, I'm really, we are all really uh, waiting to hear from you in, in a few minutes. So ngayon po, um, could I please give Give the floor to the resource person from Oxfam. Uh, are you here with us? Yes. yes. Uh, Attorney Patricia Miranda, please. Yes. You have the floor. Hello. Uh, maraming salamat, Senator Risa. Uh, magandang tanghali po sa ating lah lahat. Uh, committee members, resource persons, and also those watching this inquiry online on social media. Uh, hello. Uh, ako po si Patty Miranda, Head of Policy of Oxfam Pilipinas. So this sets forth the position of Oxfam in connection with the Senate resolution on the gender dimensions of the COVID-19 crisis. We already submitted our position paper to this honorable committee, and we will share with the wider public as well additional reports and resources, resource materials. And this includes the COVID-19 rapid gender assessment, finding an analysis by Oxfam Gender Justice Advisor, Jeanette Kindipan Dulawan and Ariel Asturias, the Time to Care campaign report from Oxfam International, as well as findings from our REACH project in Maguindanao, accompanied by a think piece by our frontliners based also in Maguindanao, Unifil Women's, Nor Abo, and Oxfam's Abi Ayaw. They wrote a piece called Violence or the Virus, Mindanao's Displaced, Forced to Choose. So Oxfam is an international confederation working together with local partners and communities in more than 90 countries. That is why we laud the Committee on Women, Family Relations, and Gender Equality and give our strongest support for this legislative inquiry. In May 2020, Oxfam Pilipinas, together with 26 organizations, many of whom are here today, although virtually, like PLAN and UNFPA, UN Women, UNICEF, have already shared our collective findings. So we were part of the conduct of a COVID-19 Rapid Gender Assessment, or RGA, which covered 950 respondents from urban, poor, and rural communities across six administ administrative regions in the Philippines. So we, we won't uh, discuss what was already mentioned earlier, but uh, we will amplify that of the total 60 returning migrant workers who were surveyed, 95% said that they received government cash support or ayuda. Majority of them were female. However, sadly, the majority also shared that the cash assistance was not enough. Further, the RGA results showed that vulnerable women and girls, particularly solo, young, 4P beneficiary mothers have been negatively impacted the most as they put in additional hours of unpaid care work, spending up to five hours more per day now that uh, amid the lockdown and amid the COVID pandemic. And two other economically vulnerable groups are young persons and the LGBTQI. These findings, together with our additional research and analysis, uh, as well as our project learnings, uh, all of which are accessible online and outlined in our position paper, affirm that women and girls living in poverty are particularly hit the hardest by health emergencies and humanitarian crises like COVID-19, more so when this crisis is compounded in areas which are remote and those affected by conflict. 
Additionally, implementing partners of Oxfam's Creating Spaces project from Lano del Sur and Maguindanao have reported an increase in child early and forced marriage in evacuation centers during the quarantine period amid the ongoing armed conflict. This affirms the resolution of the Human Rights Council that the incidence of child early and forced marriage is highly exacerbated in humanitarian settings. Therefore, the COVID-19 crisis and its far-reaching impacts underscore further why measures to protect the girl child must be urgently enacted. And this, of course, includes Senate Bill 1373 or the Girls Not Brides Bill of Senator Risa Contiveros. Uh, in close, we respectfully urge that a gender perspective be integrated into plans and strategies to enable response operations to reach the underserved and at risk, especially women and girls. A gender perspective is needed to ensure response operations do not reinforce discrimination or enable violence to thrive. As shared by our teams in Mindanao and our implementing partners, failure to account for the different needs of women and girls can lead to inappropriate and even harmful responses, such as neglecting to include menstrual uh, hygiene items, or failing to provide sexual and reproductive health aid and counseling in evacuation centers and displacement camps. We worked with UNICEF and the DOH in developing a national policy on washing emergencies and disasters, an administrative order enacted amid the pandemic, which includes provisions to strengthen gender in humanitarian wash response. We do hope that this policy is fully implemented and laud the DOH for this timely and much needed measure. We also urge that the availability of comprehensive sexual and reproductive health services, such as emergency contraception and continuity of post and prenatal care is easily accessed by women and girls in a timely manner. Reproductive health clinics must be able to operate and continue to offer services and communities are fully informed where to go for their needs. And of next, we would wish that gender-based referral Gender-based violence referral pathways are strengthened, and this includes hotlines, social protection, and community care services. And again, to amplify, we urge the enactment of Senate Bill Number 1373, or the Girls Not Brides Bill, and support our campaigners and girl defenders, many who are watching and many are who are here today in this very meeting, pushing to put an end to child marriage in the Philippines. To close, while it may be true that extraordinary collective efforts are needed in these extraordinary times, response action should not lead to diminishing the dignity and agency of affected communities who are dealing with multiple threats and compounded crises alongside COVID-19. Therefore, it is vital to interrogate how resilience is framed and claimed, especially when weaponized to justify the use of force. We need to question and even challenge depictions of resilience that reinforce gender stereotypes or gendered inequalities, or when so-called resilience narratives are used to cover up gaps in disaster governance accountability. Thank you very much. We are so grateful for your time, Senator Risa, all those present today, the committee, those watching online. Maraming salamat. Maraming salamat din po, Attorney Patty, at sa Oxfam. So now we will hear from our last but not the least CSO uh, this noon mula sa Philippine Legislators Committee for Population and Development. Ms. Nitz, you have the floor. Magandang hapon po. Hapon na. Magandang hapon po sa lahat, Madam Chair, to the other guests. I'm reading the PLCPD and Child, right Let Child Rights Network's position paper. So we have submitted a copy through email, but allow me to please... Uh, read some parts of it. So like the rest of the speakers, we too commend the initiative of your office, Senator Risa, on urging the Senate to put the spotlight on the gender dimensions of the COVID-19 crisis because it is crucial for the government to look into how most vulnerable sectors are affected differently by this pandemic guided by a gender lens. As mentioned by UNFPA um, and Oxfam too, child marriage, violence against women and girls, as well as maternal deaths and unintended pregnancies have worsened as a result of the pandemic and its quarantine restrictions. Because of the lockdown measures, women and girls became more vulnerable to abuses that alarmingly happen inside their own homes, and some of them are even perpetuated by their own family. Even worse, the current crisis adds another layer of barrier to reporting, response, and for preventive programs to to um, progress as the health and security sector focus its attention on the current public health crisis, that is COVID-19. So in this position paper, PLCPD and CRN urge our legislators to study particularly the cases of children and adolescent girls 
vis-a-vis the pandemic, including its non-health implications. There are five major issues that we urge the legislators to prioritize. One is child poverty, then child and maternal mortality, adolescent pregnancy, for this child marriage, and um, fifth is the online sexual abuse and exploitation of children. But for now, allow me to skip child poverty. Um, I'll go straight to child and maternal mortality very, very shortly. Increase in child, I'm sorry, uh, in a country where the cases of children having children are high, the sad reality behind these maternal deaths is that a lot of them could actually be girls below 18 years old. Pregnancy always comes with risks to women, but imagine the greater risk that young girls whose body and mind are not yet ready have to endure. PAPCOM also warns that the pandemic further complicates the problem as rape and incest cases most probably remain unreported or underreported. There's a need to understand that the problem of adolescent pregnancy does not only come from consensual sexual activity. We call on the legislators and policymakers to ensure the efficient delivery of reproductive health services amid the pandemic by coming up with innovative ways to, to adolescents, for adolescents to have safe and un interrupted access to vital services. I'll skip the child marriage because that's already been um, expounded on by Oxfam. But just a few few more points. According to NFPA, even before the pandemic, one out of six Filipino girls are married before um, they reach their 18th birthday. On online sexual abuse and exploitation of children, uh, the country's poor and pop Poor population are further marginalized by economic hardship. Many are pushed to enter illegal activities to enter money, to earn money, and feed their family. One of the most pressing issues exacerbated by the pandemic is the online sexual abuse and exploitation of children. The Child Rights Network has in fact urged Congress, even before the pandemic, to conduct a congressional oversight to review existing laws related to OSAEC and strengthen the country's legal framework to fully eliminate it. According to a report released by UNICEF in 2017, Filipino children face greater risk online as the country has been reported as a global hotspot for child pornography and the hub for the live stream sexual abuse trade. The report stated that around eight out of 10 Filipino children are at risk of online sexual abuse or bullying. This figure is even more disturbing knowing that COVID-19 has caused us to shift our lives more towards the online space. In conclusion, we in, we in PLCP and CRN support this process and we reiterate our call for the review and amendment of existing relevant laws such as those to OSAEC, as well as the enactment of new ones, particularly on the age increasing, uh, the bill increasing the age determining statutory rape and sexual consent, ending of child marriage and prevention of adolescent pregnancy. Thank you. And thank you, uh, Nitz, at sa PLCPD. Now, dear friends, dadako tayo sa pakikinig sa ating mga uh, government uh, agencies. Um, we have about uh, 40 minutes bago kailangan kong uh, tapusin muna itong hearing kasi kami ni na Senator Amy at Senator Abby ay, uh, Senator Nancy, excuse me, kami ni na Senator Nancy at Senator Amy ay may mga budget hearings pa uh, starting at 1 p.m. So uh, we will have nine uh, government agencies speaking. So kung maaari, three to four minutes each, uh, mga kasama, beginning now with the Deputy Director of the Philippine Commission on Women, um, Deputy Director Christine Balmes, you have the floor. Hi, good afternoon, uh, Senator Risa and all the other senators who are present today. Um, we at the Philippine Commission on Women uh, recognize uh, all the issues that were presented today and we do hope to, uh, that we can get a copy of the studies that uh, were uh, shown to us today. And uh, we also want to get uh, copies of their presentations. Um, we at the Philippine Commission on Women being the national machinery for gender equality and women's empowerment uh, are continuously providing uh, GAD technical assistance despite the pandemic. Also, uh, PCW has issued, um, uh, in response to the call of uh, national government agencies, uh, we issued the memorandum circular uh, number 2020-03, uh, allowing government agencies to uh, revise uh, or and implement their fiscal year 2020 GAD plans and budget so that uh, they can 
implement uh, POPs that uh, address gender issues and concerns related to the COVID-19 situation. Uh, also, we have issued uh, several advisories uh, on the extension uh, of submission for the God Accomplishment Report 2019 in consideration of the imposition of the series of co community quarantine measures. Also, uh, proactively, uh, we responded uh, responded to women and gender issues in the time of COVID. We have uh, provided briefs and statements on the issue of threats of rape, gender sensitivity, particularly on the issue of victim blaming. And also we have uh, made online support groups for women micro-entrepreneurs under the Great Women Project. Um, the Great Women Project also conducted a women economic empowerment study on the immediate effects of COVID on women micro-entrepreneurs who are enrolled in the Great Women Project. Uh, this um, study uh, aims, aimed to identify common challenges and determine effects and understand socioeconomic conditions of WMEs to better provide relevant and gender responsive services, technical assistance, and support after the crisis. Um, also, uh, we have uh, done some gender mapping uh, on the peace. Uh, we, we will be doing a study with Oxfam on gender mapping on peace and security frontliners during COVID-19. Uh, this study aims to surface the data highlighting the gender perspective of frontline duty bearers throughout COVID-19 crisis, including their specific experiences, capacities, and needs, and to influence response policies, plans, and programs of the sectors in order to strengthen their COVID-19 interventions and in our crisis and emergency situations. Also, together with you and women, uh, to come up with a platform to uh, present the findings to raise um, awareness on gender issues that surfaced during the COVID-19 response. Uh, this study pala will be done uh, with you and women. Uh, the next study uh, that we are uh, doing right now, it's still ongoing, is the National National Rapid Household Care Survey, uh, which aims uh, to understand the impacts of COVID-19 in unpaid care and domestic work in the Philippines. This has been mentioned in a few of the statements of our CSOs. And um, in the context of COVID-19 pandemic, the Household Care Survey uh, will give evidence on COVID-19 infection prevention and control at the household community and local government level, which will serve as the basis for a subsequent capacity development programs at these levels. And it will aim to um, uh, stop the stigmatization related to COVID-19, as well as methods on how these stigmas are managed. Um, this project uh, is in partnership with uh, Oxfam and UN Women. Um, also, uh, PCW has continuous uh, social media campaigns uh, during this time of the pandemic. We have introduced the Huwana sa Panahon ng Corona. And also, we have uh, come up with some IEC materials for women micro-entrepreneurs. Um, also, uh, despite the pandemic, uh, PCW, through the Interagency Council on Violence Against Women and Their Children Secretariat, uh, provided referral service to VAW-related uh, cases received through our email, social media accounts, and telephone and mobile calls and messages. Uh, the referral services uh, contributed to the Council's efficient coordination and delivery of necessary interventions for GBV and VAW services. Uh, Senator Risa, these are some of uh, the things that ECW have been doing, and we are continuously working with other national government agencies as well as CSOs. So thank you very much again for the opportunity to be here today. Thank you very much also, Deputy Director Christine at uh, sa PCW. Now let's hear from uh, the Department of Health mula sa GAD uh, Secretariat Head, uh, Ms. Giseline Artuyo. You have the floor. Are you here? Uh, magandang tanghali po sa ating lahat. Senator Riza, Chair, this is Dr. Cheryl Gavino po. Well, Dr. Department Dr. of Health. Apo. Yes, Dr. Um, Buksan lang po yung video nyo. Ah, there, I can see you now, Dr. Cheng. Work from home po. Apo. Yes, ma'am. So, maraming maraming salamat po sa pagkakataong binigay ninyo sa kalusuga. Uh, 
sa departamento po ng kalusugan upang may pahayag din po ang aming suporta sa proposed Senate Resolution Number 446 Chair, which seeks to determine the gender-inclusive measures undertaken by the government to integrate gender lens and address the impact of COVID to women and girls. So indeed po, no, as shown po by our partner CSOs and NGOs, the existing gender and social inequalities in the context of pandemic aggravated its impact to our women and girls in various ways Then it affects the men and the boys. And, and in this light, the Department of Health issued, ma'am, several um, various uh, issuances to ensure po continuous provision of essential health services during the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, among this, ma'am, are the issuances on uh, family planning services, maternal health services, the management of pregnant women, women, women about to give birth and newborns. We also have interim guidelines on the provision of health services for our adolescents and even our elderly. We also have interim guidelines that we issued on the delivery of nutrition and immunization services and even HIV catch-up plan amid, amid COVID. We also developed and co-created social media cards together with our partners from USAID, UNFPA, and all other partners that we have, ma'am. Uh, also, ma'am, as we as our, as our partners mentioned po kanina, no, there's really a need to approach this in health systems approach. So the, the, new, the new normal strategies that we are co-creating with our partners, ma'am, uh, considered new systems approach. So the following four strategies that we are into right now, ma'am, is strengthening our health systems response with our health within our healthcare provider network through the U universal healthcare law. Number two, we are shifting our capacity building, health promotion, and provision of technical assistance to our to online platforms. Ngayon po, we are actually maximizing the use of social media. For example, boosting of social media accounts of our social hygiene clinics and treatment hubs on available HIV services has been ongoing. We have an ongoing online capacity building of our LGUs and our, uh, our regional coordinator in terms of our family planning interim distribution tool to have a regularly and a more accurate uh, data on the needs that they that the family planning needs they have, and we have at least ma'am weekly brown bag sessions for with our uh, LGUs and our CHD coordinators. Thirdly, uh, to ensure continuous provision of health services, ma'am, we are maximizing teleconsulting and teleprescription platforms. We are uh, on, we have an ongoing client-centered approach for delivery of our antiretroviral drugs and other HIV services, such as ARV refill station, courier, online, and phone counseling. While we have FP Ayuda Express for family planning commodity delivery, we also provided mom funds for our uh, health work for our health workers for PPE procurement for continuous provision of maternal health and FP services. So these PPEs, ma'am, are still separate from the PPEs that are being provided for for COVID um, uh, self service deliveries. And then, ma'am, our fourth new normal strategy, as seen po and as shown by our uh, partners, there's a need to recalibrate our targets and review our program strategies. So now, ma'am, we have an ongoing discussion with our UNFPA and UPPI for recalibration of our maternal health-related indicators and targets and interventions. And we have an ongoing functionality assessment and um, drafting of our plan for our women and children protection program where our where uh where in our WCPUs, ma'am, are currently lodged. This is together with, of course, UPPGH, CPN network, and uh, as well as with UNFPA. So the, these are just, ma'am, a few of the things that we are doing right now, together with our partners. But, ma'am, of course, this measure will be of help, really, to help us address the needs of our girls and women in the country. Thank you, po, ma'am. Okay. 
Thank you, Dr. Cheng at sa DOH. Uh, ngayon, let's hear from the Department of Foreign Affairs from uh, Director Jeronimo Sul Suligin. Are you here, Director? Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, I'm here. Pero nandito, ma'am, ang atin pong DFA Executive Director, uh, si ma'am po ang mal. Yes, ma'am. 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 Yes,
to provide assistance to these OFWs. Nandiyan po yung nabanggit na rin ng ibang samahan natin, no? financial literacy, entrepreneurship, skill enhancement. Ang ati rin pong mga o, o, consular offices have been conducting initiatives on the promotion of healthy lifestyle through programs and projects on treatment and intervention of health problems affecting women migrant workers. Throughout the pandemic, various FSPs and COs have organized and conducted online seminars and workshops to enable Filipino women gain knowledge on mental health and to equip them with self-care techniques to attain psych psychological, psychosocial wellness in time of COVID-19. Ngayon po, um, meron din po kaming tinatawag na online gender sensitivity training which we hope to cascade to all our 4,000, about 4,000 personnel. Uh, the department recognizes the need to develop a strategy to capacitate its personnel to be more gender sensitive through God competency build building. So the DFA developed an online course to provide alternative learning spaces towards strategic, appropriate, and effective God competency building, even during the pandemic. So the course comprises modules on gender, basic gender concepts, gender roles, gender mainstreaming, gender analysis, and others to sensitize our personnel to the goals of gender equality and women empowerment. The department also collects sex and age disaggregated data of its personnel. These statistics are regularly generated to measure effectiveness of God activities and to develop more targeted God policies and programs for personnel and the clients that they serve. In line with the department's effort to address the gender gap among personnel occupying third level positions, we have sent women leaders to um, programs such as the Women in Leadership uh, with focuses on double bind, negotiation skills, emotional intelligence to drive results, giving and receiving feedback, outsmart the work-life balance. Moreover, the department in partnership with the Australian Embassy in the Philippines and the Australian Awards uh, have two online courses at the moment, the Gender and Disaster Risk Reduction and the Gender Equity, Disability and Social Inclusion short course. Of late, uh, Madam Chair and distinguished partners, the DFA has conducted a webinar series on collection and analysis of data on violence against women overseas Filipino workers in partnership with the UN Women Asia Pacific. The, the webinar series is framed to better explore the role of FSPs on data collection involving violence against OFWs using the ASEAN regional guidelines on violence against women and girls data collection. Dear colleagues, the disruption caused by the COVID pandemic highlights the many, many of the economic, social, and cultural imperfections we have in our society. This may be an opportune time to rectify and reform these defects, which we uh, I myself, you know, uh, firmly believe they are rooted to rigid traditional gender roles, and it's been mentioned by several uh, speakers. But from our end, the Magna Carta on Women, the Migrant Workers Act, and similar laws remain to be the solid grounding by which we formulate policies, projects, and programs at the DFA offices and FSPs overseas. We also continue to work with stakeholders to implement them and improve these initiatives and to create more um, creative and innovative interventions. So on behalf of the DFA leadership and management, I would like to 
Honorable Committee, for inviting us today in this virtual meeting to give a few words. Maraming salamat po. Maraming salamat din po, Executive Director Maria Lourdes and sa DFA. Now let's hear from the DILG, KUSEC Marge Halushos. You have the floor, ma'am. How nice to see you again po. Huli po kami nagkita ni USEC sa pagpirma ng uh, IRRs ng Universal Healthcare Law. USEC Marge? Oh. Did I speak too soon? Pero kanina nandiyan naman si USEC Marge. Sige po, let's, uh, let me call the next uh, government agency and then balikan na lang ang DILG kung... Uh, Nandito na ulit si Yusek March. Uh, could I call on the Overseas Workers Welfare Administration, si Director Jocelyn Hapal? Yes. Magandang, yes, ma magandang, ma'am. Magandang hapon po. Magandang hali po. Ay, magandang tanghali po, Honorable Senator, Mr. Ma'am, Mr. Chair, Ma'am. Person. At sa ating pong kay Honorable Senator Aimee Ma'am and uh, our colleagues sa uh, CSOs and uh, uh, other government agencies, maraming salamat po sa pagkakataon po na ito na mapag-usapan po ang mga kababaihan sa panahon ng pandemic. Lalong na lang po, Honorable Chair, ang ating pong mga women OFW returnees. Okay. Ang ipipresenta ko po ay situation na din po dahil po ang OWA ay isa ring frontliner. Um, if I may be allowed to share um, my uh, screen. Go ahead, Bob. Okay. Share. Nariyan na po. <laughs> yes, maraming salamat. Sparting na po, yan. Thank you very much. Uh, we'd like to tell you how OWA mitigates the effects of COVID pandemic on women OFW returnees. In behalf po ng aming pong administrator, Hans Leo Katdak, ang aming pong mula sa direktiba po ng aming mahal na secretary, uh, si Sec uh, Silvestre Bellio. Uh, even before the pandemic po, even the po before the pandemic, karamihan po, ng aming mga beneficiary sa OWA ng mga programa at serbisyo ay kababaihan. Sinisiguruhan rado po natin yan especially so that uh, we know very well na karamihan po sa mga migrante rin po ay mga kababaihan. Okay. Over the years, uh, at any point in time, ang mga migrante pong nag-a-abroad ay uh, dumadaan po sa OWA 8 million na po ang uh, naging OWA members po at uh, 49% po nito ay mga kababaihan base po sa aming OWA database. They are mostly household workers sa Middle East. So we recognize po the special and peculiar needs of women in the nucleus of uh, migration. We tinitignan po namin ang kababaihan bilang migranteng manggagawa bilang mga nanay na naiiwan kung aalis po ang 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 ama ng tahanan bilang mga babae batang babae na naiiwan din po sa bahay and even the sisters grandmothers and aunties who surrogate for the family met left behind ganun po namin tinitingnan sapagkat po ang mandato ng OWA ay to for the protection and welfare ng OFW at ng kanyang pamilya um Sa panahon po ng pandemic, uh, we agree with the observation po. Nakikita na po namin yung emergence po ng impact ng, sa kababaihan ng COVID-19 pandemic. Ito po ay base sa aming sariling database sa lahat po ng mga dumating ng mga OFW women returnees. Uh, very conscious na po kami ng sex disaggregated data po para po makatulong sa ating de desisyon sa polisiya at programa. Um, ito po ay September 17, 2020. Uh, uh, stands at 208,479 OFW returnees. Ito po yung kabuuan. As we speak po today, more than 220,000 na po yan sa isang araw po ay mahigit 2,000 hanggang 3,000 po ang dumarating araw-araw dito po sa Anaya, sa Clark, sa Cebu, at uh, sa at sundo bi po sa Davao.
Kung papansin niyo po ang datos, 41% po ay ng 208 or 86,742 po ay mga kababaihang umuwi galang po sa ibang bansa. Kung sasabihin niyo po na this is less than na uh, number po ng mga kalalakihan, ang tingin po namin sa una ah uh, Dahil po ang una pong mga dumating po at naapektuhan ay mga seafarers na nasa nakasakay sa mga cruise liner na karamihan po sa kanila ay kalalakihan. Pero over that over time, nakikita po namin yung increase in the number of women migrant workers who return to the country. At uh, ito ay tingin namin patuloy po in the next months or even next year. Kaya we can expect that more uh, there will be more than this share. of women returnees. Tignan po din natin kung saan sila nade-display, saan ho sila nanggagaling. Uh, karamihan po ay galing sa UAE, na Saudi Arabia, sa Qatar, sa Hong Kong, sa Kuwait, sa Singapore po, Taiwan, Lebanon, Malaysia, and Bahrain. Kung papansinin po, uh, Kung ibabangga itong dato sa dami po ng COVID cases global-wise po, nagre-reflect po dyan sa ating displacement yung dami po na naapektuhan dahil sa COVID pandemic. So we believe that the return is of course COVID pandemic induced uh, 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 globally po. Okay. Uh, top Occupation po, ito po, nagmamanifest na po talaga na talaga pong household service workers po ang naapektuhan. Okay. Hindi lamang po yung mga the usual po na nasa Asia o Middle East, pati ho na, pansin ho namin, pati ho yung sa Europe. Kung tatandaan nyo po, kasi po, uh, lalo na ang Italia, ang Spain, uh, even po sa US, ay talaga pong nag-uuwi ang din po dahil po sa mataas na uh, bilang ng mga COVID positive. Okay. Saan po sila umuwi? Baga saan po sila? Sila po ay nanggaling po sa Luzon. Uh, 53% po ng returnees natin, uh, I mean 66% po ng women returnees natin ay galing sa Luzon. Top by Region 4A, sa Calabar Zone, Region 3, and NCR. Ayan po ang ating datos. Okay, if I may, be, may proceed. Miss Jocelyn, po. very pertinent information po itong lahat. Yes, Maitan ko lang kung ilan pa po yung slides ng OWA para it's lang so, mabudget ko yung oras para sa ibang speakers. No apologies necessary po. <laughs> Binabantayan ko lang yung oras. So ilang slides po ang OWA? Uh, uh, mab mabilis, uh, uh, I, I think mga in three slides, bibilisan ko na lang po ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Sige po, pasensya na lang. But it's really very appreciated. I just need uh, time para dun sa tatlo pang speakers. But please proceed. Uh, yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Overseas pa lang po, nag-isisimula na tayo ng pagtulong sa kanila. Food packs, hygiene kits, vitamins, at even po financial. May ayuda din po sa COVID positives po natin. Uh, lahat po ng ating overseas uh, welfare officers sa loob po ng embahada at ng konsulado in cooperation with the FA, nagbibigay po tayo ng ayuda. Okay. Ang quarantine po ay hawak po ng OWA. Lahat po ng dumarating, we ensure that everybody would be provided quarantine facilities. Uh, testing, and of course, under the whole of government approach, kasama namin ang iba pong ahensya, DOTR, DND, uh, PCG, kasama po namin sila. We ensure that there are enough Accommodation, enough transportation, uh, lahat po yan, single occupancy, ganun po natin uh, piniprevent po ang uh, pag-spread po ng COVID kung ito po ay ga kung galing sa ibang bansa. But of course, special mention ka lang po, Ma'am Chair, that of course we have women returners who have specific needs. Upon arrival po yan, may mga medical condition, health, mental health problem. Uh, at uh, marami din po sa kanila on wheelchair bound, uh, requiring ambulances, uh, napakarami rin pong dumaraan halos kada play po ay meron tayong pregnant women, marami na po kami naging babies, Nakaka ito po yung magandang pangyayari po sa amin. Uh, and of course, Uh, we provide pool, board and lodging, health and mental check-up. Meron po kaming house parent. 
we have nurses, midwives uh, provided. Uh, of course, hygiene pa supplies. Iba po ang supplies po ng mga kababaihan. Sa, and pinaka-importante po, psychosocial counseling. Dito po nakikita namin po yung istorya nila, ano po yung agam-agam nila sa pag-uwi. If I just mention po, uh, quickly lang po, yung first suicide at suicide po namin, dahil po, um, siya po ay sobrang nag-aalala na hindi siya tanggapin ng kanyang kapatid na babae dahil ayaw pumayag ng asawang. G ganun po yung pinagdada, just to underscore the point po ng kanilang mental health po sa panahon na po ng pandemya. Okay. As we speak po today, Madam Chair, and the rest of our colleagues here, pang limang batch na po namin ngayon ang re mass repatriation, uh, buong eroplano po ang uh, uh, ginagamit po, na, um, charted by OWA, to repatriate 264 remains of OFWs. Tinulungan po natin ang mga namatay natin, mga kababaihan, usually po ay mga nurses at household workers, But of course, kung ang nawala po ay ang padre de familia, ang katulong, ang kasama at tinutulungan po natin ay ang mga nanay at mga anak. Okay. Mabilis na lang po. Reintegration assistance is very important at this point, my colleagues and honorable chair and senators. Reintegration program is very crucial. While we provide temporary relief, relief through our cash assistance, nagbibigay po tayo ng 110,000 uh, pesos sa lahat po na na-displace, pero uh, we look forward doon po sa ating balik Pinas, balik hanap buhay. Yung pong mga scholarship po, mas pinagaan, pinabilis, at pinarami po namin. We have an, a realignment of our programs to ensure na mas marami pong skills upgrading ngayon, mas maraming scholarship para sa mga anak under the online and bl blended learning approach. Um, uh, we have to ensure din po na, na uh, magkaroon din ng mga entrepreneurship, hindi lamang po maliliit na livelihood. Maybe at this time, ito na yung call natin na uh, maybe baka hindi na kailangan umalis and to be subjected to vulnerabilities. So we have to think po talaga of long-term plans as recovery program po natin. In the end, ma'am, we'd like to recommend lang po <laughs> if uh, we will submit po our our position po. Uh, but initially, we'd like the LGUs to be more accepting and to be more gender-based, sensitive sa kapangangailangan, kakababaihan. Sana yung ginagawa po namin quarantine, ganun din po sa anong klase ang pagtanggap sa LGUs. Strengthen po ang OFW help list. Special lanes po for entrepreneurship, business, padaliin ang mga mayor's permit, business processes. Pagamit po ang mga local resources para po sa uh, medical facility, including health. Uh, Diyan po ay napapansin namin hindi gaano karami. And of course, we would like to seek the help, the support of the Senate, of the good senators sa aming pong pangangailangan bilang frontliner, kung matutugunan po sana yung OWA structure under the OWA Act, uh, marami po sana kaming family welfare officer, welfare officer overseas, mga legal officer na patuloy pa po kaming makakapagsilbi with special favor po sa kababaihan. Maraming salamat po, ma'am chairperson. Maraming salamat din po Ms. Jocelyn at sa OWA. So ayan, may isa pa tayong posibleng pagtulukan sa legislative side no yung OWA Act. So salamat din po para diyan. So na pakinggan po natin uh, galing sa Philippine Statistical Authority si Ms. Anna Jean Pascasio. You have the floor, ma'am. Ms. Anna Jean, um, dito ba kayo? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma okay, kung pwede buksan niyo yung video niyo para makita namin kayo. Sorry, ma'am. Work from home. Okay, no problem. Uh, so, with uh, audio tayo. Okay, you have the floor, po. Ah, po. Sige, po. Uh, the Philippine Statistics Authority acknowledged and supports the Senate uh, resolution. Um, the PSA appreciates the data that we produce, such as from the Labor Force Survey and the Survey on Overseas Filipinos, are being used, as cited by, by our friends from Centro and CMA. 
As the PSA is a data producing agency, allow me to share our data collection efforts in relation to the COVID-19 um, pandemic. Uh, in the April 2020 round of the labor force, uh, the PSA included options related to COVID-19 in some of the questions, particularly on education and employment. Um, in addition, PSA also included questions in the July 2020 round of the LFS and the Annual Poverty Indicator Survey on education, employment, social protection, and training access that the respondent availed during the quarantine period. Uh, furthermore, PSA plans to include gender-sensitive uh, COVID-19 related questions in the LFS in 2021 with funding and technical assistance from UN Women. So I would also like to share that the Philippines participated in the Rapid Gender Assessment Surveys on the consequences of COVID-19 in Asia and the Pacific by the UN Women, along with 10 other countries in the Asia and the Pacific, where in uh, randomly selected cell phone users were contacted through SMS or text message with a link to a web-based survey. This was actually in partnership with um, Globe Telecom. The data collection was conducted within a week of the pandemic between April and July 2020. For the Philippines, the number of respondents was around 3,318. So the report was entitled Unlocking the Lockdown, the Gender Effects of COVID-19 on Achieving SDGs in Asia and the Pacific. Um, the report was actually just released in July 2020. This can be accessed in the UN Women website. Uh, results show that in the Philippines, more women than men are finding it difficult to access necessary products. For instance, uh, most grocery shopping permits were granted to men, leaving women at home and limiting their agency and access to goods. Um, other indicators include the proportion of people who saw decreases in resources since the spread of COVID-19 by sex, proportion of people whose mental and physical health were affected since the spread of the COVID-19 by sex, among others. So, yung results po, uh, you can actually uh, look for the report sa UN Women uh, website. So, nag-participate po yung Philippines in collaboration with Globe Telecom and the PSA. So, the current crisis highlights the need for better disaggregated statistics. Again, the PSA supports this resolution as part of nation building and will result to more gender-sensitive statistics for policy-making and program implementation. So yun lamang po, salamat. Salamat din, Ms. Anna Jean at sa PSA. And uh, now let's hear from the Commission on Filipinos Overseas, uh, kay Mr. Michael Apatad. Sir Michael, nandito ba kayo? Yes, you have the floor. Naka-mute pa po kayo. Ayan, there you go. Um, yes, good afternoon po, Madam Chair. Maraming salamat po. Uh, if I may allow, if I may be allowed to share. Please go ahead. Okay. Um, on behalf of our Secretary, Justice uh, Francisco P. Acosta, uh, we, the Commission of Philippines Overseas, would like to extend our sincerest appreciation to the committee headed by Senator Risa for continuously looking over the welfare of women and children, especially during this time of uh, the pandemic. Uh, as exposed in the committee's uh, resolution, we fully support the proposed uh, resolution that aims to review the gender dimensions of uh, the pandemic and the measures uh, that are being undertaken by various uh, government agencies. Um, the CFO, along with uh, Sorry. Uh, the CFO, along with uh, other migration-focused uh, national government agencies, has been at the forefront of extending programs and services to protect the rights and the welfare of migrant women and children, such as the 1343 Action Line Against Human Trafficking, the Online Legal Counseling Portal, Itanong Makayato, for cases of human trafficking, illegal recruitment, domestic violence, and mail order spouse schemes, among others. CFO also provides a pre-departure orientation seminar to Filipino immigrants, partners, and uh, spouses, foreign nationals, exchange visitor program uh, participants to the U.S. and au pair program participants to Europe. On top of uh, continuing our regular programs and services, we responded to the threats uh, and uh, gender-related issues and impacts posed by the pandemic on its clientele by undertaking uh, 
initiatives that ensure the continued uh, delivery of our services to the public. We actually categorize this in two, one of which is through welfare assistance for uh, affected overseas Filipinos. We'd like to share with the committee that as of uh, September 26, we assisted a total of 556 overseas Filipinos who are not OFWs. Uh, broken down, uh, 438 of them were exchange visitor program participants in the U.S., 113 were au pairs from the Europe, Europe, and uh, five were permanent migrants. We also coordinated with the National Center for uh, Mental Health regarding the psychological and medical assistance needed by some au pairs from Denmark. In view of the uh, pandemic, some U.S. institutions, uh, particularly those in the hospitality industry, are unable to continue supporting the EVP uh, participants due to the closure of businesses, cutting short uh, exchange programs. Uh, participants were thus forced to return to their home countries immediately. Now, some find themselves stranded in uh, Manila upon their arrival due to the cancellation of domestic flights, since their ultimate destinations are provinces in uh, the Visayas and Mindanao. Now, due to the urgency nature of their return, the CFO is continuously providing them temporary accommodation and food while they are uh, here in Manila during the uh, quarantine uh, measures. Uh, the concerns arising from the implementation of the uh, exchange visitor program uh, led the CFO to arrange an online uh, interagency meeting uh, of the EVP committee, which adopted a resolution providing for uh, a moratorium on the participation of uh, Filipino nationals in the EVP program of the U.S. during an emergency meeting of the committee to address concerns of the participants stemming from issues arising from the uh, crisis. Uh, this uh, resolution was uh, consequently published in the official gazette on uh, May 25, 2020. Other uh, EVP participants uh, were also provided with online assistance through guidance by emails and chats in our CFO's official uh, social media accounts. We also continue to monitor the uh, plight of uh, our clients overseas and maintain the 24-7 uh, CFO response mechanism through the 1343 action line. Furthermore, uh, clients can either call, email, or interact via social media. We have received and responded uh, calls also and cases through our 1343 action line and that the nature of cases range from online sexual exploitation of children to domestic violence and assistance to stranded uh, overseas Filipinos. The CFO as the head of the advocacy committee uh, participated in a special meeting also with various members of the IACAT. The online meeting discussed online sexual exploitation of children and cyber crimes reported cases since the start of the ECQ. So we referred actually 17 cases to uh, different members of the IACAS. In terms of uh, innovative uh, programs for our continued uh, service for overseas uh, Filipinos, we shifted to online uh, pre-departure services in the meantime that physical operations are temporarily suspended. The pandemic did not deter, however, the CFO to fulfill its mandate of promoting the rights and welfare of overseas Filipinos. Now, because of this, we uh, launched and shifted the uh, GCP, or the Guidance and Counseling Program, through telecounseling. Um, the, this uh, innovation uh, was shifted from our physical uh, conduct of counseling, wherein uh, we do the uh, thorough counseling for our married spouse or Filipino married spouses or uh, partners of foreign nationals. And through this virtual system of counseling, CFO counselors were able to address counselors' questions on a more personal level, hopefully leading them towards empowerment in dealing with the realities of uh, intermarriage. Uh, as a timely response to the implementation of the quarantine measures also, we launched and developed immediately on March 25, the, of course, or the overseas Filipino online registration system. This is in lieu of the mandatory physical registration of Filipino immigrants, spouses and partners of foreign nationals, au pairs, and J-1 visa holders. The CFO regularly conducts series of free webinars also on its pre-departure seminars that uh, we recognize that settling overseas is one of the uh, biggest and life-changing decisions. We have so far conducted the Korea Cultural Orientation Webinar, Country Familiarization Seminar for uh, uh, au pairs bound for uh, Europe and uh, PIDOS bound, uh, PIDOS for US bound uh, 
migrants also soon. Uh, we also launched and uh, developed the uh, CFO electronic payment and collection system wherein our clients can actually uh, pay the registration fees in all buy centers. And uh, for now, we are pleased to inform that our online payment system now allows for credit and debit card payments. Well, this is also in accordance with the ease of doing business and uh, Efficient Government Services Delivery Act of uh, 2018. Um, in order to keep our clients abreast with updates also on uh, the services of the Commission, as well as the government's response, we employ the communication strategies to promote public awareness through regular posting in our social media accounts, as well as in our website. And uh, for the first time this year, we, conduct our, uh, we conducted last August 22, our first Ugnayan series online. It is originally a series of face-to-face -face meetings with the Filipino community and leaders overseas. Uh, so with the pandemic, with the effect of the pandemic, we shifted already to uh, doing it online. So that was uh, uh, last August 22, as you can see, po. and that the theme we, in, we conducted the first one in Japan revolved around the effects of the pandemic to OFs in Japan and the, how the Philippine government could assist them in terms of their concerns also. So this one was uh, participated by Philcom leaders, presidential awardees, and more than 3,000 combined Zoom and uh, Facebook participants from Japan and other countries also. Um, CFO presented government programs and assistance to uh, overseas Filipinos under the session uh, by any hand in time of pandemic during this online Ugnayan. Uh, Self-help strategies also in terms of coping with stress and other mental health issues triggered by the uh, pandemic were also shared um, during that online Ugnayan we conducted last August. Uh, having shared all this with the committee, the CFO echoes the uh, effort of the committee for this uh, proposed Senate uh, resolution. We hope that the information we provided and our participation will help the committee in coming up with a legislative measure that will continue to enhance and promote the rights and welfare of Filipino women and children, especially in our uh, healing as one country towards our full recovery from this pandemic. Thank you, Paul. Thank you rin po, Sir Michael, at sa CFO. So last but not the least, again, uh, sa ating mga government agencies, we will hear from the Philippine Overseas Employment Administration, kay Director Francis de Guzman. Sir Francis, there, you have the floor, sir. Good afternoon po, Senator Risa. Good afternoon to Senator Aimee. And uh, good afternoon to Senator Nancy. And uh, to other committee members and course, our friends from uh, civil society and fellow government workers. Um, ibabahagi ko lang po yung uh, ating uh, response sa hanay po ng TVA uh, nung pumasok ang COVID-19. Nabanggit po kanina ni Ma'am Ellen uh, ng CMA na isa sa mga partner uh, groups natin sa civil society. Yung um, feminist migration and then at the same time with COVID-19 and other disruptors sa pandemic nga, uh, alam natin na tumataas or naka-heighten yung vulnerability ng mga uh, inherently vulnerable na nga ng mga uh, sektor katulad ng kababaihan. So, um, I'll just share, um, ngayon po, I'll just share some interventions lang po na ginawa ng PUDA. In particular, dun sa assistance to nationals natin, sa assistance to migrant workers. Uh, unahin ko na po, um, locally stranded individuals natin. Uh, nakaramihan dito ay mga babae dahil... Uh, Marami po dito, ma'am, uh, noong panahon na nag-quarantine tayo noong March. These are the individuals who were um, trapped sa mga accommodation ng mga Philippine or ng mga recruitment agencies natin. They were supposed to be in the pipeline and they were supposed to be deployed. But however, since nag-quarantine tayo, and then meron na rin pong mga, uh, meron na rin pong mga um, measures yung mga receiving countries, hindi sila nakalipad. And then hindi rin sila makaalis ng Metro Manila para makabalik sa mga probinsya, sa mga LSIs. As early as March, the PUEA has um, issued Memorandum Circular Number 8 for the recruitment agencies to assist uh, locally stranded individuals. And then, uh, nagkasa rin po ang uh, PUEA sa pamamagitan po ng uh, Operations and Surveillance Division sa Anang Legal Assistance Division ng uh, intervention and rescue dun sa mga complaints po natin uh, during the ECQ ng mga hindi daw po natutulungan, mga hindi napapakain or hindi nasusuportahan. Uh, I believe po one of them, ma'am, uh, inilapit po sa office ninyo ng isa sa mga partner NGO natin ng Partido ng Manggagawa. 
So, uh, tinulungan din po natin sila, ma'am. Nagkasa po tayo ng mga mission to do an ocular para rin kausapin natin yung mga recruitment agency. Uh, even during the CQ month, April and May, yung mga lawyers po natin, uh, tumatakbo po kami dun sa mga accommodation just to check. At least yung physical presence po namin are being felt para lang po um, maramdaman din ng mga recruitment agency natin na, oy nagmamatch kami na nakikita namin yung ginagawa ninyo. Since then, we've assisted more than 200 locally stranded individuals. And just this July, uh, the Governing Board of the Philippine Overseas Employment Administration has enacted Governing Board Resolution Number 11 na may penalty na po ang mga recruitment agency na hindi mag a ng locally stranded individuals nila. So with that, we hope na kahit pa paano po mabawasan yung mga complaints na nare-receive natin dun sa mga LSI na hindi makalipad. Kaakibat po nun, ma'am, uh, meron din po tayo as early as March 16, March 15 yung first day ng quarantine natin. Uh, Nag-shift po kami from walk-in legal assistance to online legal assistance. Ang sabi nga po namin nun, ma'am, uh, pangarap lang po namin yung dati kasi iba po talaga yung dami ng client na dumadating dito araw-araw. Pero sabi namin, there is an opportunity sa pandemya na ito para mag-innovate. So, um, since we launched our online legal assistance platform in March 16, uh, they would show up until the end of uh, I think it's, uh, May 2020, we have already assisted uh, 1,917 uh, individuals, uh, 1,917 individuals um, for legal assistance, and then... Um, Sir Michael, one, one moment po. Meron pong pumapasok na ibang audio, paki-mute lang ang hindi nagsasalita. Please continue, Sir, Mike, uh, Sir Francis. Yes, ma'am. Ma'am, dun po sa 1,917 na na-assist natin sa legal assistance natin na mga uh, workers, both for deployment and yung mga kababalik po, yung mga tinutulungan ng OWA na ma-repatriate, Kadalasan po tumutuloy sa PWE or nagpapatulong sa PWE regarding their claims. Uh, 1,917 na po yung natulungan, 605 doon ang laki. The rest, kababaihan na po. Although, ma'am, hindi po ito specifically targeted na mas matulungan yung babae, but we have as a matter of policy po, uh, nung time pa po, uh, ito nga, uh, sa, uh, nung time pa po namin uh, early on pa, 2017-2018, we uh, endeavored to have a more uh, gender-targeted um, uh, assistance. Mas marami po kaming babaeng lawyers ngayon na nag assist kumpara sa lalaki. So isa po ito siguro sa uh, maganda rin nating intervention. And then lastly ma'am, isi-share ko na rin lang po dun sa information and immediate engagement. Kasi dati ma'am, uh, nabanggit po ng uh, mga kasamahan natin sa OWA kanina, uh, yung sa local government engagement, uh, dati po kasi nag iikot kami sa mga local government units. But because of the quarantine, hindi po natin magawa yan ngayon because of the uh, quarantine measures. So saan po, kami saan po kami tumingin ng engagement namin para lang po dun sa anti-illegal recruitment program? So social media po ang uh, main platform namin sa radio stations. Sa social media po, pinapull out ko po yung data. Uh, recently lang, pinapull out ko yung um, sa Facebook Analytics po kasi sa backend niya. Uh, doon po namin nakita na ang reach pala namin for in terms of information and engagement, mas maraming babae. Uh, 41% ang men sa reach ng information dissemination namin on anti-legal recruitment programs. 59% are women. In terms of uh, engagement, ito po yung mga usually mga nag inquire nagsasend ng message sa amin. We have 71% are women and 29% are men. And because of this intervention, ma'am, uh, sabi ko nga kanina, opportunity uh, to innovate during the time of the pandemic. Dati po kasi hindi kami nakakapag-serve ng clientele on site pa yung mga nasa Saudi, mga nasa UAE, mga doon pa. Kadalasan dito lang namin sila masaserve pag naka-uwi nila. Marami na rin po kami nasaserve ng mga clientele kahit nasa on site pa because of the technology nga po na uh, nandiyan. So ang um, maaano na lang din po siguro namin ma'am uh, in terms of uh, kung pwede po kaming uh, humiling din sana po ma'am uh, ang hinihiling po namin as with other government agencies uh, kapareho na rin po ng Department of Labor our parent uh, agency uh, kasama rin po uh, sabi nga po ni Administrator Olalia ang aming admin 
Uh, ang malaking problema po kasi talaga namin sa pag-roll out ng mga programa na ito is yung technology support. So siguro po ma'am, uh, ang, ang maire-recommend ko po dito sa usapin natin na ito, for us to be able to better serve, kasi nandyan po yung interventions, for us to be able to better serve, we hope that the uh, technological backup would be there. Because as we've seen, uh, the engagement, especially yung mga kababaihan po natin na dati nakikiyang lumapit, dahil syempre, inherently mahiyain ng babae, andyan po yung ano nila, mas nakakalapit sila ngayon dahil Facebook nga yan, social media, email, nakakatawag sila, yung mga ganyan. So with better technology and with better support po sa back-end na ito, mas may deliver pa po natin yung mga servisyo na uh, pwede po natin may handle hindi lamang po sa mga uh, OFWs natin, particular po doon sa iba pang mga kababayan natin na gustong manilbihan o gustong magtrabaho sa ibang bansa. Yun lamang po ma'am, uh, maraming salamat po. Maraming salamat din po Sir Francis. Noted po yon at salamat din po sa um, POEA. So at this point, uh, friends, I very, very warmly thank our CSO partners, and also very warmly thank uh, our national government agencies for sharing all of your insights, all of your data in today's hearing. Uh, habang po tuloy-tuloy ang pandemic, we continue to see, as we have seen again so uh, starkly no? uh, in today's hearing, we continue to see how structural inequalities are exposed or bubbled to the surface or are revealed to have uh, manifested during uh, this past half year. And gender inequality certainly is one such inequality. We need to keep these conversations going. Uh, I hope around the table, ganun ang pakiramdam ng bawat isa sa atin. I ask our CSOs to continue sharing with us your experiences from the ground. Irreplaceable po yun. I ask our government agencies, yung mga counterparts namin, uh, dyan naman po sa executive, to continue, as you have so well done today, continue listening to these experiences and then reflecting them in the programs that you implement na sa panig naman namin, sinusubukan namin i-reflect sa aming policies na inililikha. And most importantly, for all of us, Listen to women. Listen to girl children. As the irreplaceable Ruth Bader Ginsburg said, women belong in all places where decisions are made. So, everywhere. Uh, nang may lubos na pasasalamat sa lahat at uh, nadagdag ang pag-asa na magpapatuloy ang ating pakikipagtulungan sa isa't isa, alang-alang sa mga babae at bata. Uh, this committee, committee hearing is adjourned.